All right, everyone, I think it is time for us to begin. All right, I've been watching the numbers pile up and we've got people still coming on board, but we're gonna go ahead and launch, okay? I wanna first of all say good morning to all of you. We have a, between 140 and 150 people registered over the next two days for the Gateways to Opportunity Higher Education Forum. I'm Joni Scritchell with INCRA, and this is really going to be a very exciting two-day virtual conference. We are, as always, grateful to the partnerships that make the forum possible. Originally, this was conceived about 20 years ago, if you can believe that, back in 2004 as a way to bring faculty together to collaboratively create the Gateway's ECE credential content areas and competency descriptors. So those first forums were held every other year. And then based upon faculty requests, we moved them into an annual event. So today is actually our 16th forum. Our theme this year is equity and diversity. Early childhood leads the way. Throughout Illinois, faculty serve increasing numbers of highly diverse adult learners, members of the EC workforce. Early childhood faculty strive for equity for their students and often lead the way at institutions in making changes to instructional practices that better support a pipeline of diverse adult learners. We've made strides toward equity and we can learn a lot from each other as we work to advance equity and diversity throughout the state. I wanna take a minute to say thank you to the longstanding partnership between INCRA and the Illinois Department of Human Services, as well as the Illinois Head Start Association who helped fund the forum. And we could not host this event without the rich collaboration and ongoing partnership of the Illinois Board of Higher Education, Illinois State Board of Education, the Illinois Community College Board, and the Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development, and of course, all of our faculty partners. So thank you all for being here with us today. Well, we have a packed agenda for the next two days. And as we launch the forum this morning, let's just take a few minutes and go over the plan for today. Let's learn who's in the audience, where to find meeting materials, and share any key information about using Zoom to maximize your experience. The first part of our agenda this morning, after opening remarks from well-respected leaders in our field, we will convene a state panel comprised of experts from state agencies. The state panel is always a favorite among faculty. And then today we've divided the state panel presentations into two sections with some time built in so that panelists can answer questions submitted by all of you. And yes, breaks have been included throughout the day. We are not going to keep you tied to your laptop or desktop. All right, following the state panel, Christy Chadwick from Illinois Board of Higher Ed is going to share highlights related to ACE. Then we're going to take a lunch break. And following lunch, faculty colleagues, including Dr. Nancy Latham, Judd Curry, Marcella Duran, Dr. Lindsay Meeker, Jenna Kim, and Dr. John Adair Ernst will share resources and opportunities. And then to close out today, we have a selection of three different interest sessions. You can learn about prior learning assessment with Dr. Marie Donovan and Ann Brennan from DePaul and Oakton, respectively, or learn how to break down the language barrier, creating a Spanish language associate degree uh, from College of Lake County colleagues, or you can attend NLU's presentation on innovative competency-based credit for prior learning models. So many choices, but you can only attend one. So who's in the audience? I would just have to first comment that we have more deans with us today, uh, uh, probably eight to 10% of our audience this morning, uh, which we're really excited about. We have about 92% of all of our higher education uh, institutions represented here. Um, look at the range of roles that are with us. So it's quite exciting. And again, we have a number of our state agency leaders uh, and representatives with us. We also have meeting materials. An email was sent earlier this week and it should have contained an agenda, session descriptions, bios for the speakers, entitled higher education maps for the Gateways credentials. If you didn't receive those materials or have any trouble in opening something, why, uh, please just let us know. We want you to use the chat box today to type in questions. Anything you type in that chat box will come to the hosts or co-hosts. Questions submitted are gonna be collected and then we will answer them during designated Q&A sessions that follow the presentations. And while we're on Zoom features, I'm gonna ask all of you just if you wouldn't mind taking just a minute to type in the chat box, 
A huge thank you to Julie Lindstrom here at Inker. Many of you know Julie. She has put so many hours into all the behind the scenes work that it takes to organize a forum. Julie is really an expert here in both planning and implementing the forum. She's a host and she's gonna receive your comments directly. So if you wouldn't mind sending a thank you to Julie, I would really appreciate that. If we were in person, we could stand and applaud, but that's not possible. So type a comment in the chat box and thank you for that. All right, let's get started. Joining us today to launch the Gateways 2023 Forum, we have Ginger Ostro and Dr. Brian Durham. Both hold the role of Executive Director for the Illinois Board of Higher Education and the Illinois Community College Board, respectively. Since speaker biographies are shared in the meeting materials, I'm not going to read them, especially since I really think all of you know Ginger and Brian. They bring strong leadership to their respective agencies. So I'd like to say welcome and thank you both for joining us today and sharing opening remarks. Ginger, I think you're up first. Terrific, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, um, to be with you this morning. And I'm going to um, share some slides, but Brian and I are both going to um, trade off sharing some updates with you um, and really helping to contextualize how the work, um, particularly of the consortium, fits into the broader higher education strategic plan, but also give you a picture of what's in the strategic plan overall. So if you give me just a moment to share. Okay, hopefully you all are seeing my, my screen. Is that working? Yes, okay, great. Um, so the strategic plan, I'll just start here for one second, I think, and I hope everyone knows, um, is called A Thriving Illinois, Higher Education Paths to Equity, Sustainability, and Growth. And we'll walk um, you through why, um, why it's called that and what that means to us. Um, of course, I'm sure many of you um, are familiar with the higher education system in the state of Illinois. Um, our public universities are private nonprofit institutions. Um, we have some for-profit institutions um, and importantly, 48 community colleges. As you can see on the right, this is a map that's on our website um, that shows you where all of our institutions are located and we've just updated it so it's much easier to see um, what type of institution. So we encourage you to take a look at this if you have any um, questions or interests about who who's where and what type of institution. You can hover over this and it'll give you some basic facts about each institution. This is kind of an, a new and updated feature on our website. Um, so tons of information on the IBHE and the ICCB um, website. So I always encourage people to, um, to go there. So um, you may know that the Illinois Board of Higher Education is responsible for coordinating or is I love to use this quote, the 1964 founding document said, the Board of Higher Education was formed to coordinate and otherwise bring harmony to the disparate boards and institutions of the state system of higher education, which you, which you just saw. One of our central um, responsibilities is to partner with the Community College Board, and this year we did um, with ISAC, to set a strategic direction and establish a strategic plan for higher ed in the state. Um, we went through an extensive process, and as I scanned who was on. Many of you were part of that. So I thank you for your work as we developed the strategic plan that was adopted by IBHG in um, June of 2021 and then endorsed by ICCB um, later that summer along with ISAC. Um, we are, um, if I were going to summarize the, um, the strategic plan, A Thriving Illinois, and just really just in a couple of slides, I definitely start here. Um, with the definition of a thriving Illinois, because we think higher ed, a strong higher ed system is essential to ensuring that the state can thrive and really focusing on an inclusive economy, broad paths to prosperity, um, especially for those facing the greatest barriers. And really, if I were gonna summarize the whole strategic plan in, in kind of one statement, I would say that at its core, it's saying that educational equity and Illinois' economic growth are inseparable. And I think you'll see that those are um, themes that we come back to. So the strategic plan has three goals in it. Um, as you can see, equity, sustainability, and growth. First, and really at its core, as I mentioned, is equity, focusing on closing equity gaps for students who've been left behind. 
Sustainability focuses both on affordability for families, but also making sure that we have a strong system of institutions in our state that can meet the variety of student needs. And finally, that focus on growth and making sure that we are um, developing the talent that we need, as well as the innovation that um, for Illinois to drive economic growth. Now, as I mentioned, we did this work in collaboration and together with ICCB, and it really aligns with the ICCB specific goals. So I'm going to turn it over to Brian to take you through some of the initial work. Um, Brian? Thank you, Ginger. And I want to also thank you for bringing Harmony to the higher education system. Um, Ginger and I and Eric worked um, uh, so uh, closely throughout the development of a thriving Illinois. And um, it certainly uh, community colleges um, are and see themselves as core partners in that system, in this plan. There is so much um, work that really cuts across all the uh, various different types of higher education institutions. Um, and really, I, I wanted to share with you um, that the endorsement of the ICCB of the plan after the collaboration and work that we did um, was, was actually pretty easy because it was so directly connected to the three board goals that our agency has worked under for many years. And as you can see, um, in particular, equity is the top line goal that our agency and um, through our role in coordinating the community colleges um, works through and guides the system on. And so, that connection has been one that fit perfectly um, and made such sense, made such good sense for community colleges um, as we worked to put the strategic plan together. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of other uh, uh, initiatives that are connected here. But also, I did forget to say, welcome to the forum. We're so excited to see all of you here and on behalf of our board. Um, great to see the 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 many um, faces that I know and, and um, all the hard work being represented. So if we could move to the next slide. Um, so the, the strategies outlined in the plan are really in the thriving Illinois are gonna put us on a path um, to close equity gaps. And there are a, a number of strategies and we're not gonna go through all of these, but I did wanna highlight a couple. Um, so if I could, the speaking of the learning renewal and student support and in the equity conversation, really we are building also off of the work we did as a system through learning renewal, which is all tied to um, some of the pandemic work and, and that bright light that ultimately shined on the equity gaps that, that we saw. And you're gonna hear more about that in a little bit from um, Stephanie uh, and others. So I don't wanna say too much on it. Um, but we definitely leveraged some resources on that from P20 Council and such. And then also, if we could go to, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide, equity plans. Um, we are working as a system to do a, a lot of work in the equity planning space and then doing specific outreach for adults. So if we go to the next slide here, Ginger. Um, so the... Um, this notion of institutional level equity plans, the strategic plan establishes that goal of equity plans and practices as a specific tra uh, strategy. And it's under House Bill 5464 um, that requires public institutions, and that's all community college, university, public institutions, and encourages private institutions to establish equity plans and implement practices to close gaps in enrollment, persistence, completion, and student loan repayment rates. And this really builds on a body of work that the system has done um, in some other contexts um, and with other partners, but ultimately something that the through Thriving Illinois, that the folks that worked on this um, decided that this needed to be expanded across the system. In the equity plans, we are considering learning renewal strategies. Um, again, you're gonna hear about some learning renewal stuff. Um, we're thinking about and the plans will necessarily have to review and revise existing policies and practices that exasperate equity gaps, um, using disaggregated data at multiple levels to understand points of intervention and whether solutions are working, 
I'm talking about and using equity impact analysis or a structured approach to ensuring decisions are made after analysis of impact on underserved groups. So not only using data, but figuring out how we make decisions using that data and the use of campus climate surveys and ultimately professional development that will be designed to um, help institutions meet these equity goals and the pieces that uh, they put in their equity plan. Um, I will tell you that this is an incredibly exciting work, um, that there is an advisory committee underway right now that's co-chaired by ICCB and IBHE, and that advisory committee is developing recommendations for com components of equity plans and strategies for their ultimate implementation. And we do expect and look forward to sharing with you recommendations um, from the equity plans early this summer. Um, so that's that's really a really exciting work that we're doing there. So I'm going to turn it back over to Ginger, who's going to talk um, about a couple of other things. Great. So the, thanks, Brian. And I, I agree, the equity plan work is, is really one of the core strategies and so excited to um, be expanding it system wide um, over the next you know, months and years. The, the second um, group of strategies, as I mentioned, falls under the goal of sustainability. And as you can see here, I'm, I'm not gonna spend time when we're not gonna dive into any of these, but it really does focus on how we're investing in higher education, how we're supporting students and how we're addressing those financial barriers that um, keep so many students from enrolling, persisting and completing. And I think you'll see in here, and, and, and hopefully you'll hear a theme, and I'll try and pull it together and, and with Brian at the end, um, of how much the Early Childhood Consortium touches on many of these strategies um, that are throughout the plan. So I won't spend time here, but I do want to go to the next section, which is our growth um, section, the, the area that really focuses on talent, making sure the state has the talent that it needs. And, you know, there's lots of strategies here that, that are really core for the consortium. Um, you can see it's its own strategy and we'll, we'll talk about that more in our just quick opening and you'll hear more about that. And so many of you obviously are part of the work there, um, but that's an explicit strategy that was laid out in, in the plan. But I think what you also see as you look at these and the ones that we've highlighted is how um, it's definitely part of making sure that we're matching the economic development needs of the state, focusing on what the state needs um, in its workforce. And if we don't have a strong early childhood system, as you all know, we can't support anything else in the state, but we also know how important it is to support the early childhood um, workforce and growth as, as just part of the talent needs of the state. So it really on two levels is addressing um, what we need and one of the in another of the strategies here in the plan. Um, also wanted to highlight on um, it, the strategy focusing on teaching and learning and how to prepare students for success for the work in the future. And this is absolutely one where I, I hope you all know and appreciate how much we value the work on competency-based education, um, prior learning, so many things that early childhood is led on that is about preparing um, students for success in the work of the future and how we um, ensure that our higher ed systems are providing the right kinds of teaching um, methods and modalities. So another way in which early childhood has really led on this that, that we want to adapt from as we're um, implementing the strategic plan. And then this other area, the strengthening the credit transfer system. Um, at, at its heart, the Early Childhood Consortium is about making sure that students stay on track as they move from their um, associate's degree to bachelor's degree or as they upskill with credentials. So wanted to just take a moment to highlight all the ways that the consortium really exemplifies so much of what we're doing in the plan, including all of the work that Brian talked about around equity. And of course, the consortium, it, um, the consortium itself. Um, Obviously, we're focused here on alignment of the higher education system um, to make sure that we're better serving the incumbent early childhood workforce, really identifying and recognizing um, what we need to do to have a system that supports the working adults, as Brian mentioned in, in his part of the presentation, making sure that students who have credits can transfer seamlessly, that we're providing supports, that we're addressing the, the barriers, the financial barriers, the student holds, the scholarship needs, 
um, making sure that students can get back to the school and have the support to identify the right school for them. All of those things are embodied in the work of the consortium and all of that informs what we're gonna be doing forward as a, as a higher ed system. Um, I can't say how important this work is um, to really setting the stage for the, the future and what we're doing going forward with the higher ed system. So many things we're learning, so many ways of working together, I think just show not just how important it is and the work that we can do for our early childhood community, but what it Im implies and can mean for the higher ed system and the strategic direction of the higher ed system more broadly. Um, I'm going to ask Brian, you know, to jump in here and, and add some additional reflections or comments on the consortium, because I think, again, we can't um, overstate how important it is from so many fronts. Yeah, I, Ginger, I think you you captured it so well. I, I, I would just add, um, as you look across the strategic plan, and I think just directly to the points that Ginger's making there, I hope you see early childhood threaded throughout, serving adults, transfer education, wraparound services, you know, focusing on reduction of debt. Um, there's so many of the strategies that go across this plan that ultimately are wrapped up in the work that the consortium is doing. So it, it really a model for how many things I think are going to move forward and how we weave together all these different strategies towards student success. Great, thank you, um, Brian. I think um, we, I think we'll just leave it there because I know you're going to dive into all this work, but I think we really is, just wanted to spend a couple of minutes con con um, contextualizing all of it, highlighting for you how important we see this work being, and how excited we are to have all of you um, as experts and partners in what we're trying to do and really leading the um, the work of the state. So I will um, turn it back, I guess, to um, Joni, to uh, get you started with your panel where you're going to dive in more to the work that's underway. And, and let me just thank everybody who's on and everybody who's participating in implementation and development of any of the strategies or the work of the consortium. It is so powerful um, and so excited to, um, to be at this, at this point with all of you. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, um, to share these remarks at the, at the beginning of your conference. Have a great uh, conference. Likewise. Thank you, folks. Thank you. And thank you, Ginger and Brian. We really appreciate you taking the time here uh, to join us today. That was a great overview of kind of the vision and direction for our higher education system overall and how that really kind of connects to all of us. I think that's going to serve us as a great backdrop for the panelists who are going to be sharing more details uh, that are embedded in these efforts. And Ginger, I just have to comment. I, I really agree that early childhood is setting the bar high uh, for all of our, um, all the programs at all of our institutions throughout the state through their uh, use of innovative practices, uh, for their forward thinking and direction as we work to advance um, a thriving Illinois. So thank you, Ginger, and thank you, Brian. So much appreciated today. All right. Um, okay. Let's move forward on the agenda. That was a great launch. You can see on screen here the order of our state panel presenters this morning, and we have a break in the middle. Uh, as we welcome our state agency representatives on the panel today, please know that an important aspect is that we have dedicated time to answering questions from the audience. So your input is really valued and important. Get your fingers ready to type, folks. Type questions in the chat box um, as, as uh, individuals are presenting or at the conclusion. It is helpful if you would put the name of either the individual or the agency to whom you are directing your questions. And once again, in the meeting materials, you already received the bio. So I need you to refer to those because I'm really not gonna be reading those. We're gonna have um, uh, Illinois Board of Higher Ed, Illinois State Board of Education, Illinois Department of Human Services speak first, take a, take a break. Uh, and then we'll have Illinois Community College Board, the Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development, and INCRA share. And then uh, again, two times for Q&A belt. So we're super excited. All right, let's get launched here. Let's go ahead and move forward to launch our state panel. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephanie Bernotite. She's the Executive Deputy Director of the Illinois Board of Higher Ed. I think Stephanie's one of the most strategic and hardworking individuals I've ever had the pleasure to meet. Stephanie's always so thoughtful in her approach to really building 
inclusive partnerships, and thinking about how we further develop state systems. I really wish we were meeting in person so that we could all applaud you, Stephanie. I want to say thank you for joining us today. Oh, Joni, thank you so much for those kind, kind words. Um, this is one of my very most favorite meetings of the year because it is such a, a joy and a pleasure to get to spend time with such incredible colleagues at our colleges and universities across Illinois and to see your work featured um, as we highlight the incredible collaborative and innovative <clears throat> things that you're doing in your courses and in your programs. So um, with that, I'm going to ask you to take a moment to picture in your mind a quilt and picture a quilt that you might have or a family member might have in a chest, on a wall, maybe a quilt you've seen at a museum. Um, Today, in my part of the state panel presentation, um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit closer to the pieces and parts of the quilt. Ginger and Brian and their opening framing about a thriving Illinois and how the early childhood work that you all lead um, at your institutions and as part of the consortium uh, fit together beautifully. Um, they gave us sort of the macro picture, if you will, uh, the full quilt to look at. I'm going to zoom in a little bit and highlight some more pieces and how they tie together. So with that, Julie, I'm going to ask you to advance to the rest of this slide and into slide five. You've already heard that um, a thriving Illinois has three broad goals. Um, several thousand stakeholders played critical roles in helping to shape these goals and strategies. So these goals include um, closing equity gaps, improving the affordability and sustainability of higher education, and growing talent for our state's current emerging and future workforce needs. If you'll advance, Julie, through this slide and the next one. I want to zoom in on the quilt to some of the pieces creating the equity picture. Um, and would like to highlight for you today some other work that's happening around the state that connects to the work you're doing daily in your programs. First of all, as you've heard from Ginger and Brian, one of our key equity strategies is to support learning renewal. Um, and that work is happening in our elementary and secondary schools, as well as in our institutions of higher education. Um, I want to feature for just a moment an initiative in partnership with the Illinois State Board of Education, the Illinois Community College Board, and the P20 Council. Um, as the P20 Council, in in 2021 took a careful look at the education landscape during the pandemic. Um, that group convened thinkers across the state, you were perhaps part of one of those work groups, to talk about how we could ensure the academic and overall well-being of our learners as we moved to and through and beyond hopefully the pandemic. One of the key strategies from among evid many evidence-based resources uh, that that group selected and recommended was a focus on high impact tutoring. From those recommendations was born a cross agency effort in partnership with our colleges and universities to launch the Illinois Tutoring Initiative. This to date, as, as we know it, is the largest state-led tutoring initiative in the nation. It features partners from Illinois State University, Northern Illinois University, Governor State University, Southern Illinois University Carbondale, Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, Southeastern Illinois College, and Illinois Central College to provide high impact tutoring to priority school districts across Illinois that have been most impacted by the pandemic. <clears throat> Um, to date, this project is serving over 2,000 students in grades three through eight reading and math, as well as high school math. 
and involving over 700 trained tutors who include aspiring educators from your teacher education programs. Um, candidates can apply to be tutors whether or not they are attending the institutions that I listed that coordinate this effort. And I'm very excited to tell you that um, early indications about the impact of this effort have been extremely positive. We are working with Illinois State University and researchers there to build out a very clear evidence-based picture of the impact of this work and looking forward to releasing those results later this fall, excuse me, later this summer. Um, additionally, Ginger and Brian spoke about learning renewal happening at our institutions of higher education. I wanted to briefly highlight for you that among the federal relief monies that came to states, each governor received emergency education relief or GEAR funds. In Illinois, those funds were apportioned to our schools and our colleges and universities, and we have been collecting um, information from the very innovative things your campuses have been doing to use these resources to bring into your institutions vulnerable students who have been deeply impacted by the pandemic, as well as to retain students who have had um, severe impacts related to pandemic issues. So these funds have been used to expand food pantry hours on campuses, to provide expanded access to counseling and mental health services, to grow academic tutoring services online and through peer supports, uh, to ensure, among other things, that students have access to the technology that they need. Um, the kind of innovative efforts that have happened through the GEAR work, we look forward to highlighting, and I just wanted to share with you um, a few glimpses into how we're supporting student learning renewal at the state level. Um, also want to just briefly highlight that um, the legislature passed a, um, a body of work last spring that was focused specifically on students experiencing housing insecurity. And so each one of your campuses in partnership with ICCB and the Board of Higher Ed has identified a liaison who will be um, supporting students to uh, get access to the resources they need if they're experiencing short term or longer term housing insecurity. Next slide, please, Julie. Um, we're going to continue to zoom in on this quilt about learning renewal and student supports and just highlight here that as we are seeing through institutional reports, the really effective use of these resources to help students with their overall uh, needs wrapping around what supports them to be successful in their classes. We're bringing together communities of practice. Um, the house liaisons will be gathering in mid May at National Lewis University. University for a conference to share the work they're doing with one another. We're connecting the gear coordinators as well as other benefits navigators um, required by state law. Um, all of these folks have overlapping work. Their students certainly have overlapping needs. And I'll return to this notion of communities of practice a little later in my remarks. Thanks, Julie. Next slide, please. You've already heard uh, Ginger and Brian speak about how we're advancing equity through the strategic plan through a um, work to establish um, institutional level equity plans. The zoom in um, on this picture that I want to highlight for you is that the Board of Higher Education has a faculty advisory council comprised of representatives from our community colleges, our public universities, and our private institutions across Illinois. In tandem with this equity strategy, that body has convened a work group led by Dr. Julie Clemens, professor of music at Illinois Central College, to develop a curated list of resources for faculty across all our campuses to help faculty members be great partners with their institutional leaders in developing or expanding existing institutional equity plans and also to um, have access to great resources to advance equity inside their own classrooms, labs, and other teaching settings. I'll look forward to making that resource available to you via um, the INCRA team as the conference concludes and also want to note that this is an ongoing work in progress. So 
if you don't know who your FAC um, Faculty Advisory Council liaison is, please know that they are always welcoming additions to this curated list. And I know there are experts in this forum who would definitely have great resources to add. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Again, um, you heard from Ginger and Brian about <clears throat> institutional equity planning, including diversifying and recruiting and retaining talent for our institutions. Um, you'll hear a little later today at the forum about um, a Board of Higher Education grant program to grow diverse faculty for our early childhood programs. Um, I'm really excited for you to hear more about that work and just want to thank um, University of Illinois Chicago, Lewis University, National Lewis University, and Illinois State University for their partnership in this work to specifically support individuals to obtain graduate degrees that would qualify them to be faculty in your programs. Next slide. <clears throat> When we think about improving the affordability of higher education and the sustainability, I want to zoom in briefly to note that in this year's uh, budget, address, budget address by Governor Pritzker, he proffered um, for legislative consideration a recommended increase in MAP funding of $100 million. This is a very exciting development, and as we look to see um, next steps with the legislature this spring, those increasing investments in our MAP program will continue to support students of, of need to attend our institutions of higher education. Next slide, Julie. We're also embarking on and have embarked on, led by Deputy Governor Martin Torres, Senator Sen Senate Majority Leader Kim Lightford, uh, Representative Carol Ammons, and IBHE Chair John Atkinson, a a, a commission, excuse me, on equitable public university funding. Um, if you haven't been following that work to develop a plan in Illinois for how we adequately, equitably, and predictably support public university funding, I invite you to check out our website for more. Recommendations from that body will be delivered July 1. Next slide, Julie. <clears throat> I'm returning to the growth strategies and wanted to illuminate for you, next slide, a couple of wraparound pieces that are happening um, in tandem to the work that you do. I'm gonna particularly call your attention to the logo in the upper left corner of this slide for the Behavioral Health Workforce Center. <clears throat> Um, this center was um, announced formally by Governor Pritzker in mid-March of this year as part of the state strategy to align our higher education programs to workforce needs. Um, prior to the pandemic, the legislature had launched a task force to address um, a parallel issue that um, exists in the field of mental health. We understand this well in education, a shortage of qualified professionals serving our communities in the field. That shortage of behavioral health uh, workers has only increased in parallel to what we see in education. And so this behavioral health workforce center housed at Southern Illinois University School of Medicine and the University of Illinois Chicago, like the consortium, will include partnerships with public and private institutions all across Illinois to link our programs of study to do several things. One, to create stronger pathways for people who aspire to enter the field of mental and behavioral health in various roles and to help them complete their degrees. Two, to support individuals already working in these fields to have access to programs of study and professional help development that help them advance in their careers. And thirdly, as a result of all of these efforts, to eliminate the deserts of behavioral health services that exist in Illinois, um, places where services are limited, particularly in underserved and underrepresented communities. So although this may not uh, be work top of mind for you, I wanted to highlight this part of the quilt, if you will, for our strategic plan, because it certainly connects to the work you support um, early childhood professionals to do in linking families to community resources for broader wraparound supports. 
I also wanted to highlight that we are about to undertake an assessment of higher education needs in the Quad Cities. This is a response to legislation charging the Board of Higher Education to do that work. And while it has a very localized focus, um, that work will also result in a model that will help all of us across Illinois and all of our institutions to um, well assess the emerging and future workforce needs that arise in our communities, our regions across Illinois, and how we can align and get access to the incredible programs at our institutions of higher education that will meet those needs. I'm going to go ahead in interest of time and move on to the next slide. Um, I'm not going to delve into this deeply, except to say that over the last couple of years, all of our public universities have joined many of our uh, private institutions in using the common application or the common app as a way to more seamlessly, seamlessly support high school students in applying to college. Again, I'm going to move through this quickly, but we'll just give you um, a second to see that this is having a very positive impact on different demographic groups applications to our Illinois colleges and universities, an important part of pipelines into your programs. Next slide. And finally, I'm going to wrap up by zooming in just a little bit closer to the quilt, if you will. Um, for a thriving Illinois to note that um, to date we have a lot to celebrate about the work that you and your colleagues have achieved in this very intense sprint to launch and begin the work of the consortium. We are settling into a bit of a jog right now um, in terms of the long term for this work because this work will be ongoing as you heard from Ginger and Brian it's pivotal in so many ways, not only to the field, but also to the broader community concerns of Illinois. Um, one point of celebration of many today is that um, as of February, over $19 million in scholarships to 2,000 scholar, 2, scholarship applicants have been released. And that is a, a number that is evolving daily due to your hard work. Um, I'm going to also circle back to the notion of communities practice, communities of practice to close out. As we continue to evolve the work of the consortium together, this work has been um, built on the premise that we can do more together than any one of us can do alone. And so as we continue to work, um, we will be building out from some of the models I talked about earlier for our house liaisons, getting together and sharing best practices, you'll um, start to see um, in next Monday's consortium meeting and moving forward communities of practice where we share the great work that you're doing and continue to uh, sharpen and enhance uh, the various services of the consortium. So with that, I'll close and thank Joni for the opportunity. Well, thank you, Stephanie. I have to say, I just love that reference to a quilt. Um, I really think a quilt is a great visual of the range of work around the state, of all those small and large pieces that it takes to form a really well-designed uh, quilt, not to mention stitches behind the scenes that hold it all together, right? So that was um, a really perfect visual. I know you were kind of um, rushing to keep us on time there at the end, but if there's something you want to go back and add in later, um, please, uh, please feel free to do so. Such good news uh, in terms of the scholarship information shared. So thank you for that as well. So a quick reminder to everyone, um, again, uh, if you want to put your questions in the chat box, uh, you can send those questions to the three hosts, uh, Stephanie, Julie, and I. And the plan is that what you type into that chat will come to us as hosts, and then we'll kind of sort it out to send each question to the specific panelists that it was uh, directed to. Now, some of you have been asking about access to these slide decks, and please know that we post every year's form on the Gateways website. So next week, you got to give us a few days, uh, we will post the 2023 form slide decks uh, and some of these recordings. All right, next on our state panel, uh, we are privileged to have Dr. Jason Helper. He is the Deputy Officer for Instructional Education at the Illinois State Board of Education. Jason has such a deep 
appreciation and respect for the critical role of teachers at all levels in our educational system. Jason's bio is included in the material sent earlier, so I'm not going to go any further than that. But Jason, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today and welcome. My pleasure. Thank you, Joni. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So there are, of course, uh, similar uh, examples and, and programs uh, that we'll, I'll build off of from what Stephanie suggested because of the partnership between IBHE and ISBE uh, in supporting our uh, educators as they are candidates, as they enter into the field, and certainly uh, retaining them in, in uh, school districts and community-based organizations. So today I will share with you uh, hopefully some just reminders about some licensure flexibilities that have occurred over the last couple of years, uh, the IEPP, the Educator Preparation Profiles, and some information on teacher recruitment and retention. Some of it goes a little far uh, afield from early childhood, but it is important uh, to build off of Stephanie's beautiful metaphor of the, the quilt. It is part of the quilt. It's part of the ecology too. our whole system of how we support and train care and tend to our uh, teachers because they are the one uh, most important variable that makes a difference in the lives of children and their academic achievement. So they are super duper important to all of us that work for uh, the respective state agencies. And of course, even more so to the parents and family and communities. So if we can go to the next slide, please. And the next one. Again, maybe most of this is, is just review for you, but uh, these are things that we are focusing on that help the Illinois State Board of Education hone its processes. Uh, it is maybe somewhat oxymoronic to suggest uh, efficiency and is be in the same uh, sentence, but really we do try to learn from what we hear from the field as well as what we hear from our other uh, colleagues like Stephanie, Brian, Ginger, uh, Marcus and the like. So you can see that there was um, the Public Act 102-174 um, looking at the associates in applied science and what, the, what it, that means in terms of looking uh, toward eventually earning that POW. And the new process in terms of transferring and what we are doing at the state board in order to assist uh, two-year and four-year institutions and in how to do those program changes, uh, we've really focused in on efficiency, whereas some of you may have undergone the experience I certainly did before I started at the board over a decade ago. Uh, we, you'd have to go before the licensure board and they would look at your changes and they would ask questions. And sometimes that could take months. And understanding uh, as a former faculty member in higher education, the amount of time it can take for program changes to happen at the institutional level, those additional months sometimes uh, were really years. Because at the time, of course, we were using paper, uh, course catalogs and things like that, which I'm not sure uh, uh, still exist. So we're working uh, in terms of how we uh, think about what a program change means, what constitutes a significant program change as opposed to something that is just trying to help candidates and faculty and programs um, quickly, but accurately and well th and thoughtfully move into the, how the new system is working. So uh, I think all of that is to say the last four points is the change requests are now sent to our uh, ISBE Educator Effectiveness uh, Department, and they don't have to work, uh, wait for uh, several uh, approval. And that does save uh, time, lots of time. Next slide, please. One of the other things, and I know, uh, thanks to Stephanie, because she introduced me to this community uh, competence-based uh, evaluation assessment of, of prior learning and what that looks like in higher education. Uh, but institutions of higher education for many, many, many years, actually, we've never prohibited it in our teacher prep rules, can look at a potential candidate or a candidate's uh, work experience. And if there are parts of that experience that, when looking at programs of study, uh, seem to demonstrate that the individual possesses the requisite knowledge, skills, dispositions, and so forth, uh, they can honor uh, prior learning assessments. Now, Again, back when I was in higher ed, we didn't call them prior learning assessments. Uh, that's a, a new term of art, which I think helps focus us in on what we're looking for in terms of making sure there's some rigor there. And it's not just, oh, you've done this thing for n number of years, so we'll just give you the credits. But it is important, uh, and I would uh, urge institutions, if they're not already doing so, to really investigate, think hard about how, especially for candidates that are, are in the workforce and want to move from one position or one field into the field of early childhood education, 
how different experiences might uh, count for, for lack of a better way of putting it, some of the other programmatic requirements. Uh, we do have ways, uh, again, from, from the um, individual candidate uh, perspective. So these would be individuals that would be outside of a, a program of study, uh, maybe coming in from another state or things like that, that we as B staff can look at uh, their, their experiences too. I would say, uh, and, and maybe I, I, I shouldn't say it so boldly, but I will, I would argue that the thoughtful work that occurs in institutions of higher education around this topic is going to yield a much more consistent and thoughtful process that we can all learn from and build from because there's already a system in place. Uh, then, although it's perfectly allowable and I understand, and I've often looked at, at some of these, of, of what that might look like for the individual candidate who says, hey, what do you think of this? So again, you can see that we have things, um, uh, well, because where is we? We have forms available that you can fill out and, and we take those forms very seriously. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, please. These credential options I wanna spend a little bit of time on because what we found over the last year and a half, two years, even though these things are, by and large have been in place, especially in our districts, and this is just an observation, it's not a critique that they don't know, districts are pretty busy just like we all are. They're um, always, uh, I would say a small majority of an audience when we speak to these that go, oh, I, can, I never knew that existed. So this is just an opportunity for us to share uh, the, the, I guess, the good news, especially in these uh, first uh, three, the short-term emergency uh, early childhood special education approval. It provides the hiring flexibility uh, in, high, in the high needs area for people that already hold a PEL and have completed some of the LBS, uh, Learning Behavior Specialist one requirements. The second, uh, the short-term approval content uh, knowledge pathway is for people who don't have a PEL yet, uh, but want to, um, they, play, they are, are, have a major in early childhood education, but that did not lead to licensure and have met other requirements based upon what uh, a particular program um, in an institution of higher education might uh, think. This short-term approval, it does require, of course, a bachelor's uh, degree or, um, yeah, a bachelor's degree in the content area or 32 hours in a particular content area that would, this would be outside of early childhood, that would um, allow the endorsement to be issued. So for instance, again, not necessarily tied to early childhood, you have somebody who's majored in physics, uh, they have the, major, the full major, the bachelor's degree, and maybe even more, and they would like to teach in a physics classroom, they can get the short-term approval because they have those 32 uh, hours, uh, some at the lower uh, 100, 200 level, and then 300, 400 level. Uh, at the undergraduate. And then the um, others is the 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 short-term approval on Appel. Early childhood education uh, can be added as a as a three-year short-term uh, approval if nine hours of coursework have been completed. So why I wanted to spend a little bit of time on these and focus in on them is is maybe to frame the landscape or, or take a walk through a particular landscape to make a distinction that is, um, it's an important one, but because of the way that our rules are laid out is often one group doesn't know what the other group is doing. So part 25 of our rules, that's what talks about all of, of what an institution with an approved program needs to do in order to um, entitle somebody for an endorsement. It talks about out of state requirements and so forth. Our higher education faculty, many of them know that backwards and forwards. I, I certainly did when I was in the field, I know less of it now, um, but the other part to this, and this uh, is for our P12 community, is these uh, different credential options, they are operationalized in part one, which is when we talk about assignability superintendents, curriculum coordinators, HR uh, folks at districts, they care about assignability. So again, wanting to share a little bit more time to, uh, to, to think through this uh, out loud, because one of the things that can really help when thinking about the early childhood workforce is making sure, and, and I'm putting a direction to it, uh, it, it, can't, it could be either way, but in this uh, audience, with this audience, making sure that the higher education faculty are really working with their respective districts to explain the difference. Because I know from the, the experiences working with superintendents and hiring managers from districts, they don't think of the 
short-term emergency this or the Pell in that. They want to know who and who can I assign to this classroom. So thinking and understanding that there are different terms and different ways of understanding the difference between credentialing uh, entitlement and assignability, critically important. And I'm happy to, of course, respond and, and do some collective thinking with, with folks if you're interested in doing that. But I found that has made such a big difference. And even in some instances from superintendents who were really worried about particular uh, content areas or grade, grade bands or grade levels, when they hear that this is available, they go, okay, we can control this, we can contain this now, we can put the right people in front of our children. Uh, uh, next slide, please. All right, the IEPP. So Illinois, and you can go to the next slide, I'm sorry. Illinois is one of uh, a few states that have spent the time, resources, and good thinking to really consider um, teacher preparation program accountability. And of course, accountability discussions are often a lot of fun when thinking about the what, and not a lot of fun when thinking about, okay, what happens when a program is, when it doesn't meet these bright lines? Uh, as I've said, since we've started the IPP work years ago, um, I'm looking at Stephanie who might be able to, to shake her head yes or no. I think that was probably six or so years ago. And working with faculty from higher education, working with, again, hiring managers, superintendents, principals, teachers, to think about what is an accountability system that gets at the important pillars of what a program should reasonably be held accountable for. And I wanna emphasize that because accountability systems don't work really well when they're not reasonable. And so this IPP has been honed uh, a number of different times. We continue to reflect on it. And it is for two purposes, one of them, we believe it is for program continuous improvement, things to reflect on. Nobody's going to you know, have their knees cut out or no program is gonna have their knees cut out from under them if there's areas of concern. The next step for that is, okay, we've identified things. How do we work together? What kind of supports do you need? Because um, that's just good teaching. <laughs> uh, and then um, other you know, sorts of things that we're, we're very pleased about is this second bullet point. Um, not only because of the data, not only because of the uh, IDES uh, data, but because of the very, very heavy lift that it took to integrate two state systems. Now, IEPP is a much smaller system than the data that comes from the Illinois Department of uh, Employment Security, but that it could be done, to me, is really exciting in being able to see a workforce from uh, looking at the most early experiences of a child uh, when they're in the public system and hopefully keeping them in Illinois through higher education and into our workforce. That's a pretty interesting data point, uh, I would think. You can see that some of the highlights of IEPP, 6% um, increase in diverse candidate enrollment. Of course, ISB is rolling out some supports as uh, higher education uh, programs. Uh, work on their diverse educator recruitment plans. So we are uh, providing supports to the field of what do these look like? How can we make them actionable? Because of course, again, going back to that bright line of reasonable, there are ways of uh, incentivizing um, who and uh, applies to a program, but that is limited. I mean, th th there are certain things that I think that, uh, that an institution probably cannot control. And so when we think about these diverse educator recruitment plans, we're thinking about it in light or through that lens to, to help support the larger goal and make sure that that support occurs in, uh, through individual institutions in the best ways that they know how based upon their context. Uh, next slide, please. So Stephanie, uh, I she gets the award today for the beautiful slide on the early childhood access and flourishing for equity scholarship program. Much better. I am not a designer by any means, but the points are the same. This is a very, very powerful and important program. And thinking about how to help people that want to be teachers. I mean, they, these are the these are the uh, our the tier one, not EBF tier one, but the tier one individuals, these are people that have a sense of calling to do this work with our youngest learners. Uh, really important to say, hey, we invite you and we're going to help you. We're not just gonna say, if you wanna do it, figure it out yourself. So, uh, you know, thinking back and, and 
not trying to come across as at all cynical over the last 20 some years that I've been in uh, Illinois education, uh, either as a faculty member or at the State Board of Education. There's been a sea change in how we support and nurture uh, those individuals who want to do this work. And that to me is, is really important and also very touching in all the, to me in all the right ways. We're doing the right thing. We're treating people the way they deserve to be uh, treated. Um, in addition, pardon me, I'm trying to minimize my screen here. Um, the uh, PDG V5 grant, so this is really our second go around, although we call it PDG V3, uh, V5-3, because the way that the PDG grants have worked in the past is there's a year planning grant and then a three-ish year, depending sometimes they extend uh, the, the spend window um, for the implementation. And this year uh, in January, late January, we received the next iteration of the planning grant. The assumption being that sometime in the fall, uh, because the, the planning grant is one year again, uh, sometime in the fall, they will issue another uh, RFP for Illinois to apply for the longer PDG grant. So lots of different uh, programs that are a part of that. Some of them relate more closely to the early childhood workforce uh, work. Some of them are very closely aligned with data uh, and looking and re-looking at uh, our needs assessment, our landscape scan of where we are at the state. So that's very exciting uh, work. Lots to do in about 10 months, but uh, we're happy about that. Uh, next slide, please. So these are three grants just to show, as I mentioned at uh, the outset of my comments, and I will again steal from Stephanie, the quilt of what's going on in terms of educator recruitment. So it's not just uh, targeting our early childhood educators. We're thinking about those who may wish to become teachers generally. So that's the CTE Education Career Pathway Program. So this is where districts can work and, and develop a, a, a pathway endorsement that focuses on education. There are dual credit opportunities. And this is a great way for young people uh, to dip their toe while still in high school, dip their toe in, in the river of uh, being a teacher in a, in a public education system uh, and see if it's for them. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, the, the Diverse Educator Recruitment and Retention Plan kickoff in August 23. We are moving that through our internal uh, funding process. We have a bilingual education grant, which will, uh, over a number of years, fund people to receive the bilingual uh, ESL endorsement. That's, a, that's a, an endorsement that cannot be a standalone endorsement. One has to have a Pell already. But we have identified those districts that um, have a... EL population, but they don't have the teachers for it. So it's very much uh, like other areas. And so wanting to make sure that all students are supported in, in ways that they um, can help them learn and feel comfortable and, and part of a classroom culture, but also using the pedagogical skills that, um, that a teacher can learn. Uh, we are doing these bilingual education grants. It's about a five, I think $6 million program. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, uh, the only other uh, program I'll add that wasn't on the slide, we're also doing some work with our special education um, teachers in order on, on retention because uh, that is a, again, it's an area of our public system. We need to uh, nurture and all and oversee in all the right ways. And so uh, we're excited about being able to uh, focus in on not just those who might want to become teachers, but all those who are interested in the early childhood grade band, working with special education students, as well as those who uh, are ELs. So once an individual is in a school, we hope to keep them in a school uh, in Illinois. So we have things like the new, uh, teach, uh, new, new teacher coaching and mentoring that's worked with IEA and IFT done virtually. It's been very, very powerful. Our board talked about it at length yesterday at their board meeting uh, about how they like to see uh, what they're seeing in terms of um, not just there's a system out there that people can, we can say, look at, look at how people are connecting with each other, but really districts are coming back saying, this is a powerful source of mentoring. It makes people feel safe. It makes people feel heard. It gives them that extra, you know, you can do it uh, sort of sort of idea when they have, as we all did when we're in the classroom, one of those days where you're going, I just don't even know what to do tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, we are continuing in our board approved yesterday uh, funding uh, for the National Board 
for professional teaching standards. That's out of ISU. It has been for a number of years, very powerful program. Um, our board is in particular interested in making sure that we are looking, uh, and I think Brian mentioned this in some of his comments too, at the equity piece. So um, we, we will this year uh, provide the, um, the, the National uh, Board for Professional Teaching Standards resource group at ISU uh, look at the district demographics and where there are individuals uh, that are would be identified, I guess, as diverse and seeing uh, if they're interested in uh, taking up this opportunity because it is a very, very powerful professional uh, growth opportunity. Uh, the word, so our, C, uh, our nine CC probably doesn't make any um, uh, sense to some of you and I apologize for putting in an acronym without thinking through that uh, about the audience. The Illinois State Board of Education, other state education agencies, there's a, a grant from the uh, IES through the Department of Ed that provides a comprehensive center. And these are organ they're usually seven, four, four to seven year degrees, depending on the iteration. And in this iteration, they uh, are working with Illinois at no cost to Illinois and Iowa. And one of the projects we have with them is really looking at the data on teacher recruitment and retention. And so the RC, uh, our, I call them RC9, sorry. Uh, but that group is able to provide some of the data that goes into those grants, uh, you know, in terms of eligibility, means testing those grants, if you will, um, that I discussed previously. And there's, it's a great capacity builder for uh, uh, our staff, but also the individuals that are part of that work stream, they are, I mean, I don't know a better way to put it, they're professional researchers. I mean, they know how to do this and think about this and are able to focus entirely on it. Um, whereas, uh, just to be honest, I mean, at ISB, we have people that are able to focus on that. They get the ideas, but they also have a day job, right? So uh, going on, um, the affinity groups, there are 49 districts currently that are working with uh, affinity groups. There's about 370 educators. Uh, Teach Plus, one of our uh, teacher I would say support uh, and, and advocacy groups is looking to further ex uh, expand uh, the network. And they're working to, in the individual affinity groups when, when the program was first developed, again, thinking about that local context. What are the important questions? Where are the needs? Where are the, 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 the uh, areas where um, a new teacher and especially a new teacher of color might require additional um, supports. And the, the, we're getting very positive responses from them. Although in some states, I mean, we're lucky to be in Illinois for oh so many reasons, but in some states, this idea of affinity groups goes absolutely nowhere because um, they see it as divisive and not helpful. Whereas in Illinois, we see it quite differently. Uh, and so we're very happy with that. Uh, I've talked about the, uh, special education grants already, and then um, cost of living adjustments for staff working in community-based organizations. That uh, it, it refers to the COLA that we gave to um, funded FY23 block grant uh, programs, early childhood block grant programs. And if you want to go to the next slide, please. And I am happy to take calls, uh, set up meetings uh, to talk uh, with you about things, uh, feel free to reach out to me. And uh, thank you, Joni, uh, for the time. Thank you so much, Jason. That was incredibly helpful. And as you were speaking, um, many of our uh, colleagues here and participants have typed some questions in. I started forwarding those to you just so you could start thinking about them. When we get to the Q&A session here in a little bit, I figured it's always good to have a few minutes to kind of pull things together. So thank you all of you who are asking questions. And Jason, again, that was um, very helpful. Thank you very much. All right, next. Um, I want here to join us from the Division of Early Childhood at the Illinois Department of Human Services is Karen Yarbrough. She is the Senior Early Childhood Policy Advisor. Karen, I know you have been at the center of many early childhood initiatives in our state, and our paths have crossed multiple times over the last two decades. So I look forward to your comments on the Division of Early Childhood and how this will shape 
IDHS's strategic direction. Karen? Thanks so much, Joni. Thanks for having us here today. It's a really exciting time in early childhood. Um, and it's just great to see all the work that all these state agencies are doing to support the early childhood field. So uh, I'm gonna dive right in with the next slide. Um, in April of 2021, Governor Pritzker announced the creation of this new division of early childhood as part of the Illinois Department of Human Services um, to signal the importance of early childhood and really elevate early childhood within IDHS. Uh, this was also in response to the Early Childhood Funding Commission's recommendations. This is a commission that the governor convened early in his term to make recommendations about um, how to expand and improve early childhood. So the division, uh, the new division of early childhood is uh, kind of still in the process of transitioning and transforming to its own freestanding division. Uh, we have operational support still from the Division of Family and Community Services within IDHS. Uh, but once we are kind of fully uh, freestanding, the division will really work to better strengthen and coordinate across its early childhood programs. I know we've talked a lot about childcare here today, but within the Division of Early Childhood, uh, the programs that our make up that are our child care assistance program, uh, including child care quality improvement efforts. We also house a number of collaboration programs and efforts, including the Head Start State Collaboration Office, the All Our Kids Early Childhood Networks, and the newer Birth to Five Councils uh, that are throughout the state of Illinois. Um, a couple of the other programs that uh, are really critical for the work we do um, is the Part C of IDEA Early Intervention Program. This is the federal entitlement program for children under three with developmental delays and disabilities. And we also run a statewide home visiting program for families with young children. So in the next slide, I'm gonna just give you a quick uh, snapshot of where we are in terms of enrollment. Um, as with many types of programs during the pandemic, we did see pretty substantial declines in enrollment, but they are now, um, you know, getting back to where we were before pre-pandemic time. So we're really excited to see that children and families are back out engaging in these programs and services that are available to them. So uh, in terms of the number of children participating in the child care assistance program as of November of 2022, um, we were back up to 113,000 children. So this is an increase uh, of 20% over the previous year. We're also seeing more providers come back into the system, which is critical and underscores our need for more uh, folks in the early childhood workforce. Um, so seeing an increase of just over 10% there. Uh, our early intervention program, we're really seeing a, a pretty dramatic uptick. This was the first program to really start to see people um, coming back into the system. Uh, we think this has a lot to do with um, what was going on during the pandemic when families and children were much more isolated and not necessarily um, having the experiences that they might have in different times um, and wanting to kind of not go out and engage in those, those prevention programs that would require them to, you know, to kind of move outside of their family bubble. Um, so seeing uh, an increase of about 11% there and continuing to grow. Home visiting um, is also growing at a more moderate pace. Uh, we're seeing about a 3.4% increase um, over the last year in, in our home visiting program. So in the next slide, um, one of the first and most critical things we set out to do in the Division of Early Childhood as a brand new division was to create a strategic roadmap and strategic plan for the really ambitious work uh, that is underway in the state. So I'm gonna walk in the next few slides, I'm gonna walk you through um, the strategic roadmap to kind of give you an outline of how we are thinking about our work. So here you'll see our North Star aspiration um, that it really guides, uh, guides the work, 
um, and helps us stay, you know, laser focused on what it is that we are here to do. I'm not gonna read that to you, but uh, we'll go ahead and move into the next slide um, where you'll see our vision, which is that Illinois pregnant persons, young children and families have the supports they need to achieve their full potential and our mission essentially how uh, explains how we will accomplish that vision by providing equitable access to uh, the range of services that we provide through the Division of Early Childhood and that really support whole child development. So the next slide um, is a pretty dense one here, but I'll, I'll try to walk quickly through the core values that undergird the, all of the work that we do here in the Division of Early Childhood. Um, so the first one is our whole child focus, which really speaks to um, you know, the critical programming we provide that thinks about children ac across multiple domains of development and also thinks about children in the context of their families and communities, which is critically important for development in the early years. Uh, our next value is quality service delivery, which means really, really making sure that we're focused on um, science, that we're providing services rooted in science um, and that have an evidence base. And we're continuing to re-examine what is working and what is not working and make adjustments as necessary. The next value is equity, which I know is a focus of our time here um, together. Um, and we, are, this is kind of at the, at the center of everything that we are doing right now in early childhood. So we are really focused on designing and maintaining programs that center equity, that center cultural humility, that work towards anti-racism in service design and delivery um, and implementation of our programs. Uh, and it's also important to note that um, DEC prioritizes serving children and families with access to the fewest resources and opportunities. Our next value is relentless pursuit of mission, which reminds us that what we're here to do mission-centered, mission-oriented work. Um, when things get tough, we know we can always use that focus on what it is we're here to do to help you know, sustain us and get us through the um, you know, sometimes differences of opinion or uh, uh, what of how we need to best accomplish that mission, but really keeping um, that mission at the forefront. The next value is stability and sustainability. This is really recognizing that um, in order to have a system of services that is, is responsive to children and families, those programs and all the places that are delivering those services um, have to have know that our programs are sustainable and they are stable. Um, obviously there are, you know, political wins that change things, but to the extent possible, really being consistent in terms of how we are supporting those providers that are out on the front lines, really working with children and families. And then the sixth and final value is respect and dignity. Uh, just focusing on, you know, really building um, responsive programs where our, uh, the folks that we work with trust us being responsible, um, being empathetic, um, and really uh, listening to the folks that we are here to serve. So in the next slide, uh, we are uh, sharing our strategic goals. Um, and these are, it's important to understand that these are all interrelated goals. So uh, noting a lot of the work cross that we do crosses um, across our, the way that we specifically talk about our goals. Um, and because we started the strategic planning process kind of towards, uh, you know, still in pandemic times, uh, the first goal was really about enhancing access and enrollment, making sure we're really reaching out um, to the families who we know need services most and engaging them in those services, making sure that they are easy to access um, and to get into. The second goal is around strengthening the quality of early childhood delivery. So this really means looking hard at how we're doing, what we're doing, making changes where it's needed both to be responsive to changes in knowledge and research, 
and also um, changes in the needs of, of children and families in the communities we serve. Our next goal is around optimizing data and technology. Um, we know that uh, this is just critical in the world that we live in today, how families access our programs in terms of the applications, um, getting information from us. So really wanting to make sure that we are modernizing our systems uh, in place to through which families engage with our services, whether it's eligibility or information sharing, uh, making sure we're providing an experience that's easy to use and, and takes advantage of um, today's technology. The next goal is, division, is building the division's capacity since we are a new division. So it's really thinking about how the culture that we're putting in place within this division, um, how we are building out the division to be responsive, um, and how we are continually improving and working on professional development uh, within our division. And then the final goal here is evaluating and adjusting funding, which focuses on really assessing our funding allocation and also our, our funding mechanisms, our distribution mechanisms to ensure that we are really getting to adequate and equitable funding. There's been a lot of focus recently on looking at the communities uh, throughout the state to, to identify those communities that have the least access. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes those are communities of color. So we really need to be paying attention again to the data as other presenters have acknowledged as well. Um, looking at what, you know, what's working, where that's working and make adjustments where we need to going forward. So then in the next slide, um, again, to further kind of highlight um, a couple of overarching objectives. There were a couple of things that just really stood out to us in our planning process that kept coming up again and again. Um, and we decided to, um, to kind of make sure that they were infused across all of the goals that we are engaged in right now. Um, so one is that uh, really authentic stakeholder engagement. Um, we want to make sure we have bi-directional engagement with all of our stakeholders, whether it's program administrators, teachers, families, uh, really hearing about how their experiences of the field uh, and engaging in conversations with those to continually be responsive um, and to make sure that, that those voices are really deeply informing our planning and implementation of the programs and services that, we are, uh, that we're doing here. And then the second one, again, is centering equity and racial equity and diversity in the planning and implementation process to ensure equitable outcomes. You gotta think about it right up front, right up first, as we're doing the planning and implementation, if we wanna actually achieve those goals. So um, really making sure that that is front and center in all of the conversations we have going forward. So then in our next slide, I'm gonna turn uh, to uh, like a more forward looking uh, work that we are doing, get into a few more specifics. Um, and it's really about um, addressing equity through compensation. So we can go on to the next slide. Uh, and I think everybody is aware of Governor Pritzker's uh, announcement early this year in his budget address, we are just truly excited that this governor has demonstrated his commitment to make Illinois the early, the best state in the nation to raise young children. Um, and his demonstration comes in the fact that he is including increased funding in his proposed budget for this year, as well as the next, uh, the next several years of his term going forward. So he has put forward a really ambitious plan um, for his second term that, that really highlights early childhood. So we are, um, of course, thrilled about that. So the work that he has proposed going forward is really building on a lot of the things that we have been doing with federal relief funds over the last few years. We've been able to really start some um, transformational work, thinking about how we are funding programs, really looking at funding mechanisms, um, and really trying to move towards the funding commission's, um, you know, extensive set of recommendations they put they put out in order to, to you know, achieve that vision. So some of the, the things that specifically uh, are kind of big picture focus of the Governor's Smart Start plan um, are minimizing childcare deserts, 
raising wages, which is really a key part of our equity strategy, addressing teacher shortage, um, which you know we're so thrilled to have all of you all here and really committed and engaged to help us do that um, in terms of, of teacher preparation. Um, and then strengthening our investments through these different funding mechanisms, including workforce compensation contracts, quality support contracts, apprenticeships, and a continued um, commitment to scholarships for the early childhood field. And then uh, again, because it's not just about kind of childcare center and home-based education, really uh, recognizing the growth in our early intervention program and the fact that a lot of those early intervention providers have not received adequate increases over the last you know, decade plus. So really um, infusing funding there to both meet the needs, uh, the growing needs that we're seeing in that system, but also to make sure that we are adequately compensating those providers as well for the critical, critical services they're providing. Um, and then and, and some additional investments in sustaining and expanding home visiting, which is really a primary prevention effort for uh, families, for new families with young children. So in the next slide, uh, it's just a quick little timeline um, to, to kind of show what we're building from. You all may have been uh, familiar or heard from the field about the child care restoration grants, the strengthen and grow child care grants and the Accelerate Child Care Center pilot program that have all been underway um, for the last several years. We are really have learned so much from these programs and we are building on the successes of these efforts as we continue the planning for the rollout of the Governor Smart Start initiatives uh, going forward. So FY24, this coming state fiscal year is really gonna be a planning year to get down to brass tacks around implementation and rollout. Um, and we're, you know, got a lot, we've got a good start and we're really excited to keep moving forward to, to talk about how those smart start workforce compensation contracts and quality support contracts look going forward. So that in the next slide, just a high level overview of how we're thinking about those workforce compensation contracts. Um, really thinking about how we, again, are true to our mission, vision, values, and goals in providing financial stability and sustainability to child care programs. We know that it is incredibly difficult to sustain a child care program, usually a small business, um, with some of the more typical funding mechanisms, uh, the reimbursement through vouchers that are um, associated with specific families and specific children that uh, that creates a somewhat unpredictable um, level of funding and a fluctuation in funding for child care providers, making it very hard to, uh, you know, cover the base costs that are always there day in, day out. And one of the major ones of those being compensation that makes up the vast majority of uh, what it costs to provide uh, quality care and education. So really these compensation contracts are designed to address just that. Um, supporting operations, specifically labor costs. Um, we hope that providers will be better equipped to meet demand at a rate that parents can actually afford. That's the other thing we have to pay close attention to. Childcare is very expensive, so not wanting to kind of drive up the costs so that families who do not participate in the subsidy program um, have found themselves just priced out of childcare. Um, so in the, in the first year, there will be a $130 million investment and there are additional investments uh, that have been proposed, again, just proposed uh, by the governor um, over the four years of his, of his administration going forward. So, and still working out the details in terms of what those costs will, and in terms of how those programs will, will roll out. But again, making sure the compensation is front and center. We know our workforce is made up of low wage workers, sometimes the, the lowest wage workers amongst many fields. A lot of those folks are women of color, um, recognizing that we really need to pay adequate uh, compensation to these folks who are doing this critically important work that uh, 
that matters for every other aspect of the economy as our previous speakers have pointed out. So in the next slide, um, go uh, thinking a little further out uh, between state fiscal years 25 and 27, the increased investment will result in more family served and uh, will allow us to think about beyond just investing in workforce compensation, will allow us to think about uh, additional quality supports that we know early childhood programs need. Um, and I will you know, tell you that it comes up again and again in our planning conversations with all of our stakeholders that additional staff is kind of number one to improving uh, quality in early childhood settings. So again, why the workforce is so critical in getting more quali well-qualified folks um, into this field and keeping them in this field is such uh, um, a linchpin to all the work that we really wanna do going forward. We'll continue to fund uh, what had been called the Accelerate Childcare Pilot Contracts. Um, and these will come kind of come under the umbrella of the Smart Start Initiative. And then also in, in terms of our longer term planning, um, thinking about layered funding contracts for those providers, about 10% of providers who access multiple funding streams, um, including the child care assistance program that we fund, but also this, the programs that ISBE funds, as well as Head Start and Early Head Start um, from the feds. And then in my final slide here, um, we know that uh, this kind of massive investment requires investments in, in kind of all parts of the systems and in the infrastructure. So here's a few of the other things that we know we're gonna continue to um, make investments in, uh, you know, making sure that people have access to childcare assistance for their uh, job search, which um, is critical. It can't take your baby along with you to the job interview. So making sure that families have access to those programs when they really need them the most. Uh, we are gonna be starting an early childhood apprenticeship program, which uh, has really kind of caught the attention of the field nationwide. We're very excited to, um, to launch this and think about how that can bridge and support a lot of the other great efforts that are underway in the state, including um, in the next bullet, our scholarship programs, really wanting to make sure we continue to maintain those investments and in scholarships. Um, this has been one of the most critical pieces of the ECAs consortium, um, making sure that our incumbent workforce members have access to all the supports that they need to go back to school and to be successful in school. Um, and then finally, um, a modernization of our uh, uh, systems for payment, access, enrollment, and all the good thing, those good things to make it easier for folks to access and to make it so that we can better um, understand our data in real time and be responsive to what we are seeing on a um, day in, day out basis. So <clears throat> I, I've covered a lot in a short amount of time. So I look forward to any questions and thank you all so much for your interest in being here today. And I'll turn it back to Joni. All right. Thank you so much, Karen. You provided some great information here into the overall work of the Division of Early Childhood and IDHS overall. Um, if uh, memory serves, I think you've got just maybe a couple of minutes here. We're going to take a break in just a second. Karen, I did forward us a couple of questions to you in the chat box, and I wonder if you um, can take just a second and scan those if there's anything you want to add, because I believe you've got kind of a hard stop here at 1025 in about three minutes. So I wanted to just allow you to have that opportunity to use uh, two or three minutes if there is one or two questions that you are able to look in that chat box that I forwarded to you if you um, if you want to address those or if we're just right up against your time. Either way. Nope. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joni. I appreciate that. Um, yes, I would love to answer these questions. So the first one is, will these uh, workforce compensation contracts provide compensation only to educators who gain credentials or degrees? Um, and the answer is, is no. What we're looking at right now is thinking about those roles, recognizing that everybody who works in child care needs to, uh, you know, be making a wage where they can actually survive and live. So it will not be um, exclusively limited to those with additional credentials or degrees. We're really thinking, wanted to do a, a, an initiative here that moves the whole field. Um, 
And then the second question is how does this impact small childcare businesses? They would be eligible for uh, these, these contracts just like any other providers are. So currently our strengthen and strengthen and grow childcare grants um, that are administered with one-time federal dollars um, are open to all types of licensed providers, homes and centers with only a requirement, the, the only kind of couple requirements, one that they serve at least 10% of subsidy children. So that's uh, children and families participating in the child care assistance program. Um, and, and the other requirement for actually, not for eligibility, but for the use of those funds is that 50% of those funds must be used towards compensation in some way, shape or form. Uh, it is not necessarily always salary. We you know, have heard from the field that it's hard to make permanent increases in salary with one-time federal funds, which is why we're so excited that the governor is committing additional state revenues um, to these programs going forward. Um, so those uh, compensation can include bonuses, can include paid time off, can include other um, types of compensation and benefits. Um, and I think that is all, that looks like all the questions I can address at this time. Um, but if there are others, uh, Joni, feel free to forward them to me and I'll, I'll try to do my best to, to get back to folks. But again, thanks everyone so much for, for um, your dedication to the young children of Illinois. All right. Thank you so much, Karen. So this concludes the first half of the state panel. And what we're going to do now is take a quick break. But again, before you go grab that coffee or take a short walk, uh, submit questions for uh, the presenters. And it's helpful if you can put the name of the person you're directing your question to first, and then the question you're putting forward. So if you have additional questions for IBHE, ISB, IDHS, Stephanie, Jason, or Karen, um, again, please uh, send those to one of the hosts here and we'll make sure we sort those out. Now, when we return from break, um, again, we're going to start by responding to the questions that were submitted to Stephanie and Jason and Karen, and then we will move straight on to our second grouping of presentations. So uh, I've got that it's about 1026, so we're going to take a 10-minute break. Please be back and ready to go at 1036, okay? 10-minute break. Thank you all.
All right, I know that was a quick break, but we did take 10 minutes. So if you are in within hearing sound of your uh, computer or laptop, it's time to start traveling back. Um, we have some questions here to be able to uh, address with our panelists, and I'm quite excited for that. I'm going to ask uh, Stephanie, I think you've had a question come in if you want to start there, and then Jason, we're going to pass the baton to you. Um, I will just say this, Jason has had a large number of questions. I doubt that in the uh, short time frame we're giving him here, uh, about seven or eight minutes, that he can answer all those questions. So uh, he will answer what he can, and then he shared his contact information earlier, so we can move forward in that direction too. Stephanie, Stephanie, let's start with you, please. Um, thanks, Joni. Uh, the question I received was about um, sort of the, the, the key feature of the Early Childhood Access Consortium for equity that, that, that I thought or that our panelists felt advanced equity. And um, I've had the benefit of lots of time to think about it, and I couldn't come up with just one. Um, and so I'll just say, I think in large part, it's because I think um, advancing equity is multifaceted work at heart. It has to be tackled from lots of different directions. So I think it's the total, the totality of the work of the consortium that is advancing equity through holistic supports, financial mentoring, navigators, all of the kinds of supports we're working to provide students. It's the entry points that validate um, prior learning and competencies and programs of study that advance individuals in a personalized way based on the competencies and attainments they have. It's the coursework when, where, and how students need them. And it's the systems that work for working adults, not requiring working adults to bend to those systems. All together, I think those things help close equity gaps. Thank you, Stephanie. Appreciate that. And Jason, over to you. Thank you. And Stephanie, thank you for the comments on the systems being set up to support those who want to take advantage of them and the, not the individuals having to bend to the systems. I think that is such an important point. Uh, I think I have uh, four or five questions and I'm going to go over them in order. And like Joni said, if there's something that is not, you know, a sufficient explanation for the particular question, please contact me directly and I'll be happy to, to um, refine or, or uh, get the answer that, that you're looking for. First question is about EC and special education, the uh, individual rights. I have a student who will graduate with an early childhood degree and special education endorsement. I understand that the LBS one is going is only going to cover kindergarten through uh, age 22 and not pre-K anymore. When will this program sunset? So there is no, nothing at this time that we're going to, we're not gonna change the uh, LBS one grade range. And this is a perfect example of the difference between endorsement and thinking about endorsement requirements and assignability and, and when they kind of run uh, into each other. So there was, as I recall, at a point in time when the LBS-1 endorsement used to include pre-K, but there were rules uh, that prohibited the person from teaching pre-K unless they also had the um, ECT approval. And that was very confusing for educators and hiring managers. So that's why the grade range was changed to uh, kindergarten through 22. And now that it is clear that educators cannot teach pre-K with just the LBS uh, one endorsement. And then uh, also, uh, this is the second part of the individual's question. Also, the student is being offered a job at a preschool for all special education preschool, but apparently does not have the ECT approval. Can someone speak about the ECT requirements? I think that someone is me at this point. So what is required is that an individual a candidate need, would need to complete coursework in early childhood special education assessment, methods for early childhood special education, development of language in the young child and ch uh, child family and community relationships. Uh, the third part, this is a great question, would it be recommended that students obtain an early childhood endorsement and not the special education endorsement and how we would go about um, starting that program? So the, I, I would need to follow up with you in terms of how do you go about starting the program? That's not for for this particular uh, moment in time. And again, please reach out to me, whoever this whoever you are. 
But if you are asking if the person should obtain the ECT approval uh, as opposed to the early childhood special education endorsement, the approval requires fewer courses and no tests, so it would be quicker to uh, obtain. So uh, again, please reach out to me um, or Joni, if you can give me the person's contact information in the, in the chat, I can reach out to you uh, about the development of the, the program. Uh, the second question, <clears throat> pardon me, would the short-term approval uh, content knowledge pathway, so that's the one uh, a person has a bachelor's degree already, uh, be an option for our ECE majors who graduated after student teaching but without passing the content test so they could get hired in a public school as an ECE teacher. Yes, that is an option, but the, in order to get the, um, sure, that short-term approval, they have to pass the content test. Um, that is, before we issue the, the approval, there, there has to be, in addition to completing the bachelor's degree, uh, that the individual passes the content test. Um, Third question, and uh, with inclusion of the IDES data on IEPP, can he, meaning me, share the categories that are included? The IEPP is still not picking up the students who completed the UIC Pell programs and who are working in Chicago Community Building Organizations. So again, whoever this is, Joni, if you can let me know, because that's great information to know, uh, so we can look into that. Uh, the IDES database, the answer, uses the uh, no, I'm going to read verbatim, pardon me. The North American Industry Classification System. Uh, this system codes for purposes, um, it's called Code 61, Educational Services, and Code 62-22, Healthcare and Social Assistance. Uh, Non-public educators are drawn from subcode 6110. Elementary and education, uh, secondary schools and early learning educators are drawn from a different subcode, Child Daycare Services. All this information is located in the technical guide uh, under the placement of the teaching indicator on page 21. And if you would like, I'm happy to put the uh, guide or the link to that technical guide so you can look through it at your leisure. Uh, the fourth question is, uh, can I ask Jace to address the following issues regarding the ECE content test? What is the status of the item analysis and recommendations for revised cut scores? and then link us to the data on the test taker scores, can't find anywhere. So I will put the, uh, to answer the second question first, I will put the link into the chat for where the, um, the data is located. That will allow an institution to do a variety of, of slicing and dicing of the data to, uh, uh, to ascertain where, where their, their program, where their candidates are. Um, new state superintendent Sanders. It's one of the, this is one of the first things that I uh, met with him about was the recommendations, not just on the early childhood content test, but other content tests as well. And we are doing some data polls to look at and give a, a, a larger view of what we know over time. And also, please keep in mind that there is a schedule. Um, by which all of these tests and their cut scores and are, and also the, the items are looked at under a very, very stringent bias review by Illinois educators, as well as uh, higher education faculty. They're the ones that ultimately make the recommendation for what that cut score is. So that work is ongoing. Uh, I, I'm not gonna give a timeline for it because I don't know, because it's pretty extensive right now. Uh, but once we are able to uh, give an answer, our, we will not only inform our board, but our licensure board and also the field. I believe there was a question too about uh, double dipping. So if uh, I'm reading it correctly, an institution is wondering, um, is there a limit to um, double dipping? Uh, this was a question, uh, it's a great one too, that was asked when we initially moved the uh, change the grade band of early childhood, have the elementary endorsement, the middle grades endorsement, and then the secondary endorsement. And we had the exact same question uh, at that time, which I think was 2012 or so. The responsibility for making sure that candidates are adequately prepared uh, by the experiences that are developed for them and determined to be uh, useful uh, in the development of a young teacher uh, is 
and at the discretion of the institution of higher education. We expect, we being ISBE, expect that you are meeting the standards. If you are or have devised a program that, I mean, you can think of it as double dipping, you can think of it as uh, concurrently offered courses with different course numbers. I mean, however you, you wish to go about it, there are multiple ways. If you're able to show data um, that your candidates in, and it could be an early childhood and elementary program, it could be a middle uh, level program, uh, maybe not to this group, but a hub, but a secondary program. If they're meeting the standards uh, through passing the content tests and other experiences that the, the uh, institution uh, more closely oversees, uh, then fine. Uh, so I, 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 I think that answers the question. And of course, I'm always interested in if I'm not answering a question for you to push back whoever asked it, but that really, we leave up to the professional uh, expertise of the faculty. Uh, we're not gonna come in and, and say, you can only, uh, you can't concurrently offer courses. We know that's not realistic, especially with um, uh, how institutions choose to allocate their resources toward faculty in particular departments, divisions, schools. So. As long as you are able to demonstrate that the program is meeting the standards, and by that meaning that the students, the candidates are able to meet the standards, um, how you structure the program is up to you. I will add one last thing that um, not it's not specific to early childhood, but I could certainly see it uh, affecting early childhood. It probably, and I don't know if it was a condition of COVID, but it, it was starting a little bit before then, there have been lots and lots of questions uh, about how to name or title a course. Hmm. And the issue is in particular uh, coming from institutions when uh, they ask for our, us to opine on it when, when a, a candidate might be transferring into a program and, and has a set of course experiences that the titles are different. And again, um, when I was at that time certification officer uh, at, at Knox College, I saw quite a bit of that. And it is up to the institution to find out what that means, because there's all sorts of different ways of titling courses or, or cross-listing courses, as all of you know better than I do. Um, the, the one example that uh, when our staff is questioning this, and I know that we've uh, talked with some faculty and registrars about this as well, is statistics. Again, I'm not necessarily saying this aligns perfectly with early childhood, but statistics can be offered in a department of statistics. It can be offered in political science. It can be offered in psychology. It can be offered in math. And how the institution chooses to figure that out is up to the institution. I mean, if you're interested in my opinion, I'll sure give it to you, but that's not germane for this particular uh, um, you know, uh, question and answer session. So uh, happy to help and serve as a thought partner if you're wondering about those things. And if you have other uh, questions, please um, let me know. Jason, thank you. thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. And uh, please know, I know we didn't quite get to all of the questions there were, but we will work with uh, Karen, with Jason, with Stephanie. And then tomorrow, as we uh, before we enter our uh, closing um, uh, session at the forum, we'll try to work a few more of those in, even if it's that we're reading a response uh, that came from one of these state agencies. So I know there's more questions out there, but thank you all for your active participation. Uh, Jason, thank you so much, and Stephanie, for taking time to answer those questions. Um, as we start the second portion of our state panel, um, I just want to welcome Dr. Marcus Brown. Now, Marcus is the Deputy Director for Academic Affairs and Student Success at Illinois Community College Board. Marcus, I often think your role is kind of that of a balancing act. You work on such a variety of initiatives that require you to listen to varying perspectives while you try to navigate a way forward. And truly, I can't think of anyone better suited for your role. I've enjoyed working with you on many projects across the years. Welcome to our state panel today, Marcus. Well, thank you so much, Joni. And I will uh, I will try to be, I would say brief, but I don't know if that's what I can <laughs> Be, but I will try to stay within my assigned timeline. So <laughs> I'll, I'll try to keep that um, uh, that in context. 
Um, and good morning to all of you all here uh, uh, at the forum this morning. I'm certainly happy to be here and to talk a little bit more uh, in detail about some of the things um, that ICCB is doing, particularly related to equity. Um, and as Dr. Durham indicated this morning, uh, sort of a beginning of, of um, uh, playing off of what our board goals are and how that funnels and, and situates the work that we do. So uh, on the next slide, you'll kind of see uh, sort of the, the bubble around um, what the goals are for the for the community college board, certainly steeped in equity and, and focused on the seamless transition and economic development along the way. And as I talk through many of the initiatives that we've been focused on, I think you all have a, a good sense about how all of these things sort of overlay with each other. And one isn't just one thing. Um, so even as we talk about equity initiatives, it's not just equity that it's that is sort of the, the outcome of that or the input of that. Um, and so I think you'll see that. In the next slide, it goes a little bit more into detail uh, about what those things mean. So certainly when we talk about access and equity, we're talking about supporting a variety of populations, but in particular minority, first generation and low income students across all um, sort of geographic and situational um, areas. So urban, rural, suburban communities, um, and again, focused on evidence-based practices and what I like to call promising practices uh, that don't have sort of the years of, of, of research behind them, but certainly have um, shown great promise in what they are um, offering in, in that particular moment. We also talk about uh, seamless transition and really what that is, is focused on um, how students transition from and into post-secondary education and then move sort of from that and out into the workforce. So making sure that those channels are all um, seamless so that a student doesn't experience disruption or hardship as they go through those particular um, channels. And then finally, um, thinking through uh, ourselves as an economic development um, support system for the system. So um, really understanding what the workforce needs are and how we can provide uh, the training that supports that or to help colleges um, to move that training forward, to expand apprenticeships, to increase credential attainment uh, and quality uh, career pathways so that folks can create and support a, a, a living wage, sustainable wages across um, their career as well. So just a little bit about the Community College Board and who we serve uh, on the next slide you'll see, and then I'm gonna try to move through a couple of these fairly quickly, but you'll see a little bit about sort of the racial um, makeup of community college students uh, across the system. So thinking through um, who we serve and how we serve them, about 47% of the students that we enroll uh, are white students, and then the rest are from a variety of um, racial and ethnic um, backgrounds. So um, thinking through what that means for um, Latinx students and for African-American students, how we serve Asian students, um, and multi-race students, they're, they're quite, you know, um, I think diversity just in who we're serving in terms of racial backgrounds. At the community college, we also know that most of our students are enrolled part-time. So about two thirds of the students who enroll at community colleges are enrolled part-time. We also know that we serve a significant number of, of women. Uh, in fact, just a little bit more uh, than 50% of women we serve um, in the community college system. So, uh, and, and across all geographic backgrounds. So um, we know that we have a, a broad stroke of students that we have to try to make sure that we are providing um, some sense of uh, access to across the state. And on the next slide, I, I think I'd like to uh, introduce to you then what we think about as equity, transition and, and economic work. So we really think about this as a focus on the student holistically. Uh, we know that we can't just sort of deliver educational programs or courses because that singularly will not be able to support students through those enrollments and through curriculum attainment. So we think about this as, as we know over time and especially impacted by the pandemic that we have to be fairly um, robust in the wraparound services that we can provide to students. So not just getting them enrolled, but how do we support their enrollment across the uh, programs of study that they do, how do we make sure that they're getting the kind of supports that they need, whether that's just in time, whether that's sort of over the, the, the whole of their program, how do we make sure that where they need tutoring and access to other supports that support their enrollment in the classroom, they're getting that. Um, Stephanie indicated a little bit earlier, we have a number of um, uh, liaisons on campuses, and I'll talk about, uh, I guess I'll talk about them for just a little bit now, 
but we that help to support a variety of populations of students. So not just um, those who might be housing insecure. Uh, and Stephanie indicated that every campus, every public community uh, campus has a housing liaison. But we also have benefit navigators who help sort of students navigate what that that puzzle is around um, services that they might be entitled to or supports that they can um, that they can gain outside the institution. We also have um, liaisons who support undocumented students. So uh, again, time and time again, as we talk about some of the other work that we do, we know that we're serving a number of students who are, who might be undocumented or who might be in households who have mixed documentation. And so the way that we are able to support those students um, becomes important. We've had a number of students um, who we have begun to serve who have um, traveled to this country and are seeking asylum. And so we know that even in the work that we do, we continue to serve those particular students. So having those undocumented liaisons on campus becomes a critical partner uh, in terms of the work that we do. And again, I, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about our, you know, another longstanding position, the veterans coordinator on campuses as well. And so that's a required position um, that that um, all of these positions have become required positions. And so we think about those not just because they are good things to do, but because we know that these are services and, and intensive supports that we can continue to provide support and services to students to help them navigate through the educational process. Uh, when we think about that uh, equity, we also think about targets in terms of enrollment and pers persistence and completion of degrees and and uh, and certificates and industry desired credentials. So it's um, so it's these are the things that we know um, that the industry needs. And so whether that looks like a, a completed certificate or a degree, or whether that looks like you've come back and you've done um, what we call ladder um, credentialing along the way, that that we know these are desired credentials, and we want to make sure that we provide those stepping stones for students, those stackable credentials along the way that help them um, continue in the in the workforce, and then. Uh, again, thinking through gaps in access and persistence and how do we use the data that we know about students. So I think beyond just saying, well, we know gaps persist, right? What we want to think about is what, what are the gaps and where are they and how are we addressing those specifically? So more than just acknowledging that there's gaps, but thinking through and using data um, to make those informed decisions. Who was who experiencing the gap? Where, where are we losing them in the process? Where could we support them better in the process? Um, so thinking through the, the increased use of disaggregated data to understand the gaps and to create better pathways that support students throughout the process. And then finally, using data-informed, evidence-based, best and promising practices. And I indicated best practices are great because it's got you know a, a ton of data behind it. It's got lots of research behind it. But we also know, and as we've heard lots of examples over the course of the morning already, there are a number of promising practices that we could be deploying that we could par we could borrow from another institution that's doing some of the work that helps us understand how we can maybe support students um, in, in more uh, holistic ways and better ways uh, in ways that we just hadn't thought about uh, and that maybe call for some increased um, data along the way, but prov uh, provide some practice for us. In the next slide, and, and a, a number of these things have been mentioned. So in some ways, I'll just sort of ditto on a couple of things, but um, Brian and Ginger talk very um, uh, detailed about equity plans. And I just wanted to provide some context for you in that they mentioned the bill for that. And, and there is a committee that's being led by ICCB and IBHE um, that is helping to establish the process and the framework that that's going to look like for um, uh, for the equity framework that comes out of that. I, I want to just also echo that we certainly know that many institutions have already been doing this work. And so we don't we don't do this work in a vacuum. So it's certainly considering the work that's already been done around equity plans. It is certainly looking at research and having a number of those um, presentations um, that help support the committee. But also these are practitioners and these are folks steeped in the work at our at our colleges and universities already who are who are helping to provide this framework for that. And so with that, there is a committee, and, and as you get the slides, you'll have a link that provides you to access to the committee and who's on that and, and the work that's being done, some of those presentation materials along the way. Again, as we think about um, what um, equity looks like, and, and certainly in the community college system, on the next slide, you, I provided 
some information for you about our Workforce Equity Initiative. The, the real purpose of this grant is to support and expand short-term um, workforce training and opportunities, whether that's credit or non-credit, uh, and high-need communities to focus on specific sectors within identified workforce uh, gaps. The program focuses 60% on African American students, but the target is to get to students, to get to students to a point where that that they are making 30% above the living wage as a result of going through that program. So I provide you there are 18 colleges who, uh, community colleges who are engaged in the in the workforce equity initiative right now, and and, and the the interesting thing is that this continues to provide um, models of support for us about how to make these programs work. And so we're serving nearly 10,000 students now uh, as a result of this workforce equity initiative, uh, really with, you know, and showing the results to do that. And so these are short term credentials. These are not students who are necessarily enrolled in, in two year programs, if you will, but they might be enrolled in, in a variety of short terms. The interesting thing about this is that it, this program not only does the development, the delivery of the program itself, but it is steeped in intensive wraparound services. It is steeped in placement for students along the way as they go through this program. It is steeped in the idea that, that assisting students with the finance uh, of this particular training programs that supports them through the enrollment, um, that might provide some stipends for the students as they enroll through the program, certainly it, um, supports advising um, and, and helping the students through um, whatever their, their needs are as they go through this program are essential to the program. So these are not separate to the programs. These are what provides sort of the success framework for making sure that students can get through the program. And I think as we learn and as we listen to some of the other things, and certainly I think a case study for the ECA's work is that we know that these, these levers are critical for students to make sure that they are able to be successful as they go through the programs. Uh, one of the other things on the next slide you'll see is that um, when we think about the Dual Credit Quality Act, one of the, the levers that we know that can support students as they think about the on-ramp into higher education is dual credit. Um, and so over a number of years, we've had lots of changes to the Dual Credit Quality Act, uh, which was introduced in the state in 2010. Um, and I think we're on our maybe our third iteration of changes uh, related to that particular act. But I want to just highlight a couple of key changes that I think have gone into effect since the last time we talked um, at the forum the last time. So it's an age thing. So every now and then I have to add my glasses back on so I can make sure I can see what I'm talking about. Um, but there are a couple of key changes, I think, from this particular slide that I want to highlight. Certainly, um, high school uh, districts can, can ask for and request courses out of the general education II framework. So that's really part of making sure that those courses are transferable uh, when the student takes those um, um, at, the, at the high school or through the partnership with the college. Um, it does provide what we call a first right of refusal for, um, for um, Illinois schools. So again, prioritizing this idea that we want students to be supported by and to continue to stay uh, in Illinois for these particular um, programs and services. But there are a couple of other uh, interesting things that I think I, I want you to take away from this slide. One is that it expands the professional development plan uh, so that we can continue to support faculty both um, at the high school level, but in terms of delivery of dual credit to ensure that they are getting the um, required credentials that they need. So it does provide space for faculty to work with their local college or university um, to submit a professional development plan so that they can be um, duly qualified to teach dual credit. And so as we think about that and as we think about its impact across the state, we want to certainly make sure that um, we continue that framework. The other thing I'll mention about that too is that it provides for mixed classrooms. Now the intention of this is really to address areas where there's a shortage of faculty already. Um, and so this idea that if you have a, high, a qualified high school faculty member, but they can't split out, you might end up with a mixed enrolled classroom. And so there are some rules that, that govern that fairly specifically or will govern that fairly specifically about how we need to make sure that that works. But again, part of it is to provide access. The intention of the, the change is to provide access, particularly for rural school districts who can't offer 
uh, dual credit in the way that they would like to. On the next slide, you see why this is so critical. What we know about dual credit is that when students are offered dual credit, they more than they almost double their opportunity um, to to persist in completing higher ed. So on that next slide, if you go to that, this is really kind of what we talk about the impact of dual credit. So um, when you look at that, those who did not have dual credit, you'll see on the hopefully it's the same for you, the right side, the short side of the slide, <laughs> uh, and then those who were exposed to dual credit is nearly double what um, the persistence and completion of those students. So, so we do know that while there's a about 75,000, a little more than 75,000 students who gain access to dual credit each year, and almost uh, each of those taking on average about two classes a year, it's critical not just from a lever of access, but up from the lever, the lens of completion and persistence. And so across racial categories, across um, income status, what we know is that dual credit can help to level that playing field and provide the supports and the integration needed for students who are um, who, who have the opportunity to enroll. So while there are lots of variations about what is in the Dual Credit Quality Act, the, the outcome of that is that we want to make sure that we're providing those same equitable um, access to students across the state. Um, as we look then more specifically, I think as lessons that we can take from early childhood, on the next slide, we talk about credit for prior learning. And so this is one of those big levers that I think came out of the work that we have been doing around early childhood um, and where we knew we could address buffers or barriers in the state. And so one of those is around credit for prior learning. And recently um, we were able to amend the, the um, administrative rules to make it to reflect the easier application of the CDA, the Child Development Associate Credential for colleges. So that's certainly one of the big ticket items from the ECA's work. Um, and so as we think about this, this allows institutions to really be able to award those six credits that are part of that recommendation at the time of admission so that students aren't waiting uh, to have that credit applied or to accumulate credit at the, at the institution in which they're enrolled. In addition to that, it clarifies that the residency requirement while still being in place um, isn't a barrier to being able to award that credit either. So, so again, institutions still have to verify the residency, so minimally 15 credit hours for a degree program, or at least 25% of the required credit for a certificate, um, consistent with HLC rules. It, it just clarifies that that's uh, an institutional requirement, but not connected to whether or not a student has accumulated credit. So again, understanding that us being able to translate the work that we're doing around uh, continuing to provide the right level of access uh, for credit uh, for students. And as we think about that, as you go to the next slide, one of the other sort of big tickets around early childhood, you know, this feeds certainly into competency-based education. But as we think about delivery of programs and, and, and how we deliver programs, whether they're modularized, whether we can sort of do more direct assessment around uh, what students are doing, what knowledge they bring to the field, really thinking about honoring the, the level of experience and training and education that our students bring to us around education. We certainly anticipate that we're going to continue to see some, some inroads into competency-based education and how that's delivered. One of the other ways that we kind of saw that and, and the merging technology came to us really sort of about the onset of the pandemic. So it was well-timed, although not intentional, <laughs> uh, in terms of how we could think about the use of technology to, in, to integrate into our training programs. So this immersion technology is really kind of centered around this idea of having a, um, artificial intelligence and AI, an avatar, an avatar, a real avatar though, and I think that's one of the differences, be able to, to uh, negotiate these training simulations and understanding where students' competency is, where students are in terms of their learning journey. We're able to steep that in, in competency assessment based on um, the entitlement standards. So how, if we're trying to demonstrate a competency, um, we can set up a scenario for students to be able to demonstrate that. So really trying to think through support of innovation in the classroom instruction and what that looks like. And this happens can happen before students out and sort of touching real students being involved in, in person. So really thinking about what is what is when do we know a student's competent? How can they demonstrate that competency 
um, beyond just sort of a pen and paper exam, if you will. And then thinking through the, the Early Childhood Access Consortium for Equity. Now, I know you're all looking at this and saying, well, that's all he's going to say about the ECA's project. Sort of, but not really. I mean, there's a whole other, <laughs> Christy's coming right behind me to talk more specifically about um, ECA. So I don't want to uh, step on her toes, except to say that, again, the work of the, the consortium is really focused on student success, on skill enhancement, and on credential attainment. So we want to make sure that the work that we're doing really focuses on that. It certainly is to solidify the transfer of the AAS degree. Uh, and so part of that legislative initiative says, how do we make sure that students who were in, who are in the AAS program continue to receive those benefits? So again, that doesn't go away with the funding that's connected to ECAs right now. That is the law. And so we will continue to support students and transfer from the AAS credential. But as we think about other students in early childhood programs, we also continue to think about how we can support them. And so in this, in this potentially final year funding from the ECA project, we're expanding the, the um, eligibility for the scholarship as well. And again, we believe that we'll be able to support all students who are in early childhood, uh, be able to, to go through and be able to be supported from that particular scholarship. So again, we, we, we expand that scholarship not to disrupt the work that's happening around the AAS, but to try to leverage all of that in terms of how we can make sure that all students who are in early childhood, particularly incumbent workers in this case, can be supported through the process um, of early childhood program enrollment. We continue to, to develop core sharing opportunities. Um, certainly in the community college, we have the ILCO system. So we continue to work through and to build a more robust system in ILCO. And certainly finally, um, with regard to the CDA implementation, um, we continue to support that. So we've collected the policies, we've collected how folks are situating the CDA on their own campuses so that we have a pretty clear understanding about what's happening uh, with students in that. And then finally, because I think I'm out of time, I'm going to run through this. These are other focus areas where we can think about how equity uh, plays a role, how we ensure seamless transition, um, uh, how we're ensuring that seamless transition, ultimately getting to um, that economic impact and getting students in and through programs. So I, I won't go into detail, but except to say these are also programs where we've taken lessons learned around support for students, um, financial levers that we can add to students, um, how whether there's scholarships attached to that or, or other financial supports for that, that we can dig through the disaggregated data and make sure that we're impacting the students who are actually impacted adversely around that. Um, I'm thinking through specifically dev ed reform in that regard, but then taking all those lessons learned and looking through like boost programs, getting them through bachelor's programs and the PATH program, getting them through healthcare related programs. Um, in this steeped in this wraparound services. So again, I know we have time for questions and I've got a few, but I'm, I will take my moment to uh, stop there and, and to uh, tra transfer the, the, the speaking, if you will. Perfect. Thank you so much, Marcus. And that was great information you shared today. And yes, we'll come back around to some uh, questions here for both ICCB and for GOECD in just a few minutes. So next up, we have Dr. Jamila Jordan. Jamila is the Executive Director of the Illinois Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development. Jamila, I don't even know what to say to introduce you. You have such a rich, rich history of professional work that I think really speaks uh, to your credibility and success at both the state and a national level. You have played such a key role in our state's focus on and support for early childhood. Um, your visionary leadership is just always dedicated to forward thinking. I think you excel at efforts to remove or work around barriers. Illinois has really benefited from your guidance at GOECD. So thank you for joining us today to share your expertise and knowledge and for just being you. Jamila, welcome. Good morning, Joni, and thank you so much, uh, you know, for the, uh, the introduction. I also want to uh, take this opportunity to welcome everyone to uh, this year's forum. I want to, uh, on behalf of GOECD, welcome you. I also want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Anita Rummage, who's in the audience, um, uh, who is a GOECD uh, team member. I also want to take this opportunity to say, uh, you know, thank you um, to all of our higher education partners, our faculty, 
our students, our administrators, as well as our, our consultants who have leaned in uh, with us uh, on several initiatives that were funded by the preschool development grant, as well as the, uh, the GEAR funding, um, as far as the development and implementation of so many initiatives. And so in my time today, I am going to take this opportunity to um, actually just have a celebration with you. We have accomplished a lot, uh, as Stephanie had noted earlier. I also wanted to note uh, Dr. Helfer uh, from the Illinois State Board of Education, uh, who mentioned our new planning grant. We are currently at GOECD in the process of closing out uh, our, our previous grant and um, again, thanking ICCB who serves as our fiscal agent for you know, that grant as we transition to the State Board of Education. So specifically uh, today, just a few uh, examples, uh, uh, the credential completion uh, cohort uh, grant, uh, the competency-based uh, BA program, uh, the Gateway's new and uh, renewal credential uh, fees, and the education reimbursement and the uh, ECE uh, level two prior learning assessment. And then finally, um, just to share with you uh, the work that we have been able to achieve in the infrastructure, addressing the infrastructure of infant and early childhood mental health consultation within uh, the state. I also uh, take this opportunity to thank um, my, my state partners, uh, the State Board of Education, uh, ICCB, uh, IBHE, Department of Human Services, as well as INCRA uh, for your leadership and, and support of these efforts. And so together with our higher education partners, we have been able to leverage both the, uh, the preschool development uh, grant as well as the GEAR grant that I mentioned to really uh, move a lot of work forward within Illinois' mixed delivery early childhood system. We've been able to uh, support, uh, provide workforce uh, supports for uh, the workforce as well as pathways. Uh, we've come to this work with a focus on, on equity. We've been able to move the needle in, in many spaces within our mixed delivery system uh, that goes uh, you know, beyond our, our time together here today. You've heard a lot about innovation. Uh, we have certainly been innovative uh, within this space. And then finally, I'm proud to share with all of you, uh, due to your efforts, we are, as Illinois always is, uh, nation leading uh, in this work and that many individuals are looking to us as far as the initiatives that we have been able to support with uh, federal funding. The early childhood uh, completion uh, uh, cohort uh, Completion cohort uh, grant uh, was five institutions, uh, Joliet Junior College, uh, Lewis University, National Lewis University, Quincy University, and Western uh, Illinois University. Again, uh, the goal of this, uh, this grant and this support uh, and this innovation was to address uh, teacher vacancies in higher need areas and specifically uh, in rural settings uh, to address infant and toddler teachers. Uh, we continue to have uh, significant shortages uh, in this area, uh, early childhood special education, uh, ESL as well as bilingual education and support for our uh, educators of, of color. As part of this, uh, when we think about testing, uh, you know, innovations, uh, you know, through this work, uh, we were able to, uh, you know, pilot uh, compressed court course schedules, as well as assessments of prior learning, uh, job embedded coaching and mentoring, um, thinking about course delivery as within a hybrid and flexible scheduling. Um, to think about additional uh, supports that we know are valuable to our workforce, uh, such as professional learning uh, communities, and then, of course, our work around competency-based uh, uh, modules. Our next effort that we funded, uh, National Lewis University, uh, was a competency-based uh, program uh, through National Lewis University. 
Uh, this was a pilot. Uh, we were able to support tuition and fees to provide a high quality, innovative cohort based accelerated uh, ECEBA program leading to the Illinois Professional Education License, uh, the PIL, uh, with the ECE endorsement as well as the Gateways Level 5 ECE and Infantile credentials. So a lot of innovation uh, in this space. And uh, at some point, uh, you know, I'll share with you where you can find, uh, you know, the information, but certainly, uh, you know, National Lewis University, uh, very innovative, uh, you know, in this space, would have more information to share. And then we we had to take a step back and you know think about uh, you know our our workforce uh, and their credential attainment. So in partnership uh, with INCRA uh, and funding opportunities, we were able to waive the sixty five dollar uh, gateways to uh, opportunity credential fees. And the fees were waived for both uh, new applicants as well as individuals who were uh, renewing uh, their uh, credentials. Uh, this universal access, again, provided with uh, the preschool development grant uh, funding, uh, helped to mitigate a barrier that individuals were experiencing. We came to learn the $65 application fee was in fact a barrier for a significant number of individuals in our, our workforce, uh, you know, due to the fact that many could not afford the $65 fee. And so uh, we realized that um, it was important to, you know, support this, this effort. We've been able to realize a significant uh, increase in credential attainment as a result of uh, funding and waiving uh, the $65 fees for some individuals uh, within the workforce. We learned that uh, you know, they were eligible for multiple uh, you know, credentials. And so they were able to, as a result of, of waiving the fees to be able to attain those credentials. Going forward, uh, you know, as we think about sustainability, uh, the Illinois Department of Human Services uh, will continue to support this initiative and make it possible for our early childhood workforce to attain uh, those credentials. The next uh, initiative that we were able to uh, fund, again, with preschool development uh, grant funds was uh, for uh, you know, debt relief, education reimbursement. Again, we found uh, as we think about access that debt was indeed a barrier for many individuals uh, within our workforce, not only for enrolling in um, uh, higher education, but being able to uh, persist within our higher ed uh, uh, institutions. We were able to uh, provide a modest uh, reimbursement uh, support in attempt to, uh, and I emphasize the word attempt, uh, to overcome the challenges. Uh, funds were used to support educators uh, currently enrolled as well as those that were um, uh, barred for enrollment. Uh, we actually learned a lot uh, you know, from uh, you know, this initiative we uh, prioritized uh, early educators uh, within the Illinois Department of Human Services uh, Child Care System Program, uh, specifically the Group Two Counties. And among all among uh, all applicants, the most commonly uh, represented race was African American, uh, Caucasian, as well as Hispanic. Um, we also found that 98% uh, uh, were mostly female uh, and the least represented among uh, the applicants were those individuals identifying as multiracial and, and, and Asian. I have to say, while we have been successful across these initiatives, there's always uh, you know, lessons learned. I think Dr. Brown had talked about, we have definitely uh, learned a lot in many of these places and, and spaces, uh, uh, but the education reimbursement really uh, comes to the top for me. And that even with our preschool development grant and our support for our workforce, 
due to the amount of debt that our workforce carries, it was not sufficient uh, to address uh, the amount of debt that uh, individuals were uh, currently responsible for within their respective higher ed institutions. And so uh, there's quite a bit of data, uh, you know, related, uh, you know, to that. There is a report that you can review, but um, it was definitely a lesson, a lesson learned and, and a highlight, uh, you know, for, for me. Uh, the next uh, initiative is related to uh, our level two prior learning assessment. You've heard a lot about uh, our prior learning assessment. Um, as I kind of step back, I, you know, I think about, uh, you know, this work. We had 30 um, faculty from our Illinois community colleges and, and universities that came together to create an instrument uh, for assessing the prior learning of over 12,000 early childhood teacher assistants without any uh, college or uh, credential, college credit or credentials uh, within the state. And it was a way for us to find a way to award college credit for our um, individuals uh, as far as what they have learned in their jobs, as well as their staff development activities, and to create a pathway uh, for their uh, subsequent enrollment in degree programs. I am just really proud of the work that's been accomplished here. You'll hear more about uh, this work uh, this afternoon from Dr. Uh, Marie Donovan from DePaul University, as well as Ann Brennan from Oakton College. But as we think about this, uh, our work here in the state related to prior learning assessment, it is definitely nation leading. Uh, individuals are already reaching out, uh, you know, to Joni and others um, regarding our work related to, you know, prior learning assessment. Uh, when we think about support and access, uh, you know, this has definitely expanded our ability to support our, work, uh, our, our workforce. Um, our partnership with, uh, you know, CBAN as we've been able to, many of us remember Charlotte, work with Charlotte um, around assessment nationally recognized in this space. Um, innovation, I think, is a common thread that we've heard throughout, uh, you know, this forum. And so, again, very innovative in this space. Uh, you know, Marcus, Dr. Brown has, uh, you know, touched on just how we've been able to leverage, uh, you know, technology. Um, wasn't intentional, but pandemic. Uh, and I, I want to remind all of you um, that all of this work was completed during the pandemic. And so this is no small uh, effort, as Dr. Brown mentioned. Uh, it was just really timely for us that we were able to uh, move into this space and uh, leverage the use of merging, uh, you know, technology. I've had the opportunity to share this work in so many places um, and to specifically uh, address individuals' curiosity around the use of avatars and assessment. Um, and so, uh, you know, as they say, more to come. And then finally, our, our DEI uh, review, as we think about uh, equity, um, the we were able to, uh, again, in partnership with uh, INCRA and CBIN to complete, as well as our consultants, uh, a national diversity, equity, and inclusion review. We wanted to ensure that all modules and everything that was presented as part of the simulations um, you know, were appropriate and not offensive to anyone uh, across those simulations. And so that review uh, you know, was was completed. And a lot of feedback that we actually received from faculty actually helped to inform that DEI review process. And so we thank you. And then finally, uh, as we think about access, uh, you know, ensuring that uh, the in instruments that were developed are available in both English as well as uh, in Spanish. And so those translations uh, have been completed. So again, to everyone, you know, I thank you. And then finally, I uh, wanted to share with you, again, uh, I mentioned uh, additional work that we've been able 
uh, to complete uh, with both the preschool development grant as well as the GEAR funding, the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund. And I'm just going to stop here for a minute and share a video uh, with you uh, from the Governor uh, that is an introduction to a public awareness uh, campaign that we have been able to uh, develop related to infant and early childhood mental health uh, consultation. So just stop for a minute um, and we'll play the video for you. Hello, this is Governor J.B. Pritzker. Infant and early childhood mental health consultation helps children thrive where they learn, grow, and play. And I'm proud that Illinois is nation leading in this arena, supporting teachers, caregivers, and families who work hard to build children's social skills and a love of learning. That job has never been more challenging, and it's never been more important. Mental health consultation goes beyond just working with young children. The program is comprehensive, offering training, technical assistance, and consultation to early childhood educators and care professionals to enhance promising practices within their programs across the state of Illinois. Our commitment to mental health consultation is backed by historic investments from the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Funding. Those dollars underscore the state's commitment to the social and emotional well-being of Illinois' youngest learners and the adults responsible for guiding them. It's a formidable task, but the way we will succeed is through innovative, proven programs like infant and early childhood mental health consultation. I applaud every teacher, caregiver, and family member dedicated to building brighter futures for our children. I'm grateful for your partnership in this effort. Thank you very much. Illinois is a national leader in infant and early childhood mental health consultation thanks to commitment, collaboration, and people like you. Thank you. I'm happy to... Uh, share with you, thank you, Julia, thank you for the shout out. I um, am happy to share with you uh, today that we are uh, officially, I guess you could say, launching. Uh, we've had a, a soft launch of our uh, materials thanks to the Illinois Head Start Association, but we are officially launching uh, this public awareness uh, campaign uh, related to infant and early childhood uh, mental health consultation. Uh, again, with federal funds, uh, we've been able to uh, develop a number of uh, one-pagers that are geared to different audiences uh, in various languages. Uh, in addition, uh, we will have videos that are available uh, as well in different languages that address infant and early childhood mental health consultation. Uh, this was uh, just shared with our uh, infant and early childhood mental health leadership team, uh, you know, this week. And so I'm just honored to use this time with you during the higher education forum uh, to share um, this campaign with you. Um, I do need to say that uh, we've been able to, uh, through the funding, we've been able to continue to expand uh, the infrastructure uh, within the state related to infant and early childhood and mental health consultation has definitely been recognized as a critical support, especially as uh, all of us know what we're experiencing within our rec respective programs as a result of the pandemic. Uh, we've been able to develop a consultant database, which will be available to our um, administrators who will have the opportunity to uh, locate an infant and early childhood mental health consultant. Um, we've also developed an activity tracker. Uh, we are, uh, again, we talk about data. Uh, and so we recognize the importance of uh, having the opportunity to track uh, the activities uh, related to our consultation throughout the state. 
we are currently, we just completed a pilot of an outcome survey uh, related to infant and early childhood uh, mental health. And just one finding among many is that program administrators noted uh, how much they value the support of having uh, a consultant uh, available to support them within their programs. I want to remind everyone that uh, consultation is not therapy, uh, but specifically used to support the administrators and staff who are serving our youngest learners. And then finally, we've uh, funded Erickson Institute uh, for scholarships uh, for this summer and fall. Um, and uh, two cohorts and individuals will have the opportunity to receive their infant and early childhood mental health consultation, uh, you know, certificate as a result of this funding. So as we uh, think about, as we're building out um, the, the infrastructure and we're thinking about, uh, you know, for future, you know, considerations, uh, we'll need to continue to work uh, to align and strengthen our uh, our infrastructure, not only as a, a mixed delivery system, but as we think about how we're integrating infant and early childhood and mental health consultation within our mixed delivery system. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, there's a growing body of, of uh, knowledge that talks about uh, the effectiveness of, uh, of supports related to infant and early childhood uh, mental health consultation and supporting children uh, exhibiting challenging behaviors. And certainly, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the pandemic has um, definitely highlighted the significant need for this support. And then finally, uh, you know, I always, uh, when I uh, have the opportunity to join you each year, I always leave you with a call to action. But there is, uh, you know, as we start to think about uh, uh, infant and early childhood mental health consultation, I ask each one of you to think about in your respective programs or within your institutions um, to, as we think about increasing the awareness of consultation as a career pathway. Uh, again, the reason why we thought it was important to develop the awareness campaign, because we find that many individuals are not familiar with consultation, but they're certainly not familiar with the opportunities to, um, to become a consultant uh, and to think about uh, consultation as a career pathway. And so, you know, I'm here to ask for your support, and especially as we think about uh, you know, diversifying the workforce. Uh, there's also, especially in our rural areas of the state, um, we are in need of more consultants. So as I um, as I close, uh, you know, today, again, I, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Joni. I want to say thank you uh, to each uh, one of you um, for your support and just being a part of, of all of these, uh, you know, efforts. Um, again, I say, Stephanie said we have a lot to celebrate. Uh, I hope you can see how much we've accomplished as we're trying to, um, you know, move and continue to move the work forward. Just a, few, a couple of more, uh, you know, items I want to say that we're, we're leaving uh, with you. Uh, we've completed a needs assessment uh, with the input of close to a thousand uh, parents, uh, we have developed a strategic plan uh, for the early childhood mixed delivery system for the state. That plan has served uh, as the foundation for the, uh, the new grant and will help guide this work forward as we think about sustainability. Uh, we have three anchor goals in that strategic plan that address uh, quality access and resources. And again, you know, support it with the voice of families that helped us with those anchor goals. And then finally, there is uh, a lot of focus on data today. Uh, we've made significant investments in our longitudinal data system, which we refer to as 2.0. We've been able to fund a child care participation uh, data set that will um, give us an opportunity to see across uh, systems uh, where our children are within various childcare setting, settings, uh, as well as our high school to college to career so that we can have some insight into our, our workforce as well. 
So again, I, I want to uh, share with you uh, that, uh, you know, the grant uh, going forward, it's this work will continue and be administered by the State Board of, of Education. Um, all of the information I'll share with you, as well as additional information, you can find reports uh, on the Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development on our website. And again, I'd leave you, as always, uh, with the governor's vision that Illinois will be the best state in the nation uh, for families raising young children. So again, I, I thank you and please, please know how much I appreciate you. So thank you. And Joni, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Jamila. We greatly appreciate that uh, wonderful overview and those highlights shared. Um, I know many of you have got one eye on the, uh, the, the clock here as we're looking at this. We're a little bit over time, but that's because we've had such wonderful information to share. And that's a very important part. So I do want to tell you that uh, quite a few questions uh, have come in for ICCB. Marcus has graciously agreed to join us uh, tomorrow again for a few minutes so he could maybe answer those questions. We'll get everything compiled for you, Marcus, and get it uh, sent off to you, even though we've been trying to move it in the chat box. Uh, Jamila, I think there might be time for one question. And then, Christy, we're going to be moving over to you next, so get ready. Um, Jamila, there was a question about as the state focuses on, on increasing the amount of infant uh, and early childhood mental health consultants, what do you think some of the training or education requirements might be for these? And the reason they're asking is higher ed is thinking, how do they get ready to think about preparing pathways for those individuals. So that might be our one and only question we can take, uh, Jamila, but I know that's uh, something that would be near and dear to your heart. Yes, yeah, so as we think about, uh, uh, you know, the preparation, uh, again, is, is uh, as we think about diversity and equity and inclusion is, you know, how we are, uh, you know, supporting, you know, diverse families living within, you know, diverse communities, of course, as we think about, uh, you know, serving, uh, you know, infants and toddlers uh, and what practices are, you know, appropriate for, um, you know, children within, you know, that space as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jamila. Very appreciative. All right. Um, again, a heartfelt thank you to our uh, all of our state panel presenters and to the morning and to all of you for your flexibility. As again, we've done a little bit of juggling here around the um, agenda today to make uh, to make everything fit. So please know you've had some wonderful questions come in the chat box. We're capturing those. We will share those with um, uh, with Isby, with Jamila, with uh, Stephanie, with Marcus, and if we're able to get um, uh, additional time beyond what we've already specified here for Marcus to share from ICCB tomorrow, we will um, be sharing responses to questions that have been asked, okay? It's great to have such participation today. Um, next, we are, um, we are moving on today here to the Early Childhood Access Consortium for Equity presentation. So, um, Christy, you've got some colleagues. You are here with the Illinois Board of Higher Education. You are the project director. Um, we are so excited, Christy, to hear from you today. So thank you so much for joining us and for your patience uh, as you have waited for us to get to this spot on the agenda. So, Christy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Joni. Um, I am here, but I'm also here with uh, a group of, of folks that we'll introduce later, Marsha Holly, and a, and a panel that will be speaking to you. Um, when we thought about what to present today, um, you know, Marks and I thought through, you know, what would be helpful to share. So many of you are part of the consortium and actually doing the work of the consortium. So we thought about what would really be interesting? Um, you know, we have a needs assessment that we've been doing, faculty surveys and, and focus groups, um, but the, we're sharing those Monday at the consortium, so we didn't want to get ahead of that. Um, we have a report that we're putting together that we're going to highlight a little bit on Monday, so we didn't want to get ahead of that. Um, and, you know, we started to think about a piece of the work that we haven't really been able to highlight yet. It's a, it's a new piece of, of this initiative, and it's a really important piece um, when we think about ECAs. Um, and as we're building towards um, an equitable future. Um, so to back up for a minute, um, when we talk about, or when I talk about the Early Childhood Access Consortium for Equity, I often show this graphic. You can tell this graphic was developed by me because it's very simple. 
Um, and it's not very sophisticated, but um, it helps to get some of our point across. Um, we talk about the role of the consortium um, and how the, the vision of this is um, that we can do more together. That is collectively, um, as one consortium, we can really go further to uh, you know, address the barriers and opportunities for our early childhood workforce. And then I talk about how right now there's really two um, areas of work. There's short-term work and there's long-term work. Um, some of the short-term work or the immediate work is um, this three-year initiative to rapidly upskill the early childhood workforce. So that is sort of one prong of the work. And that in includes um, you know, these scholarships and navigators and mentors and debt relief and just intensive supports from federal stimulus funding to do this immediate upskill. Um, and some of those things will go on in the future as, as Karen mentioned about our scholarship and, and our navigators, but there is this sort of short-term focus on um, immediate upskill. And then I talk about that there's really also a longer term focus. There's a piece of this work that is really building an infrastructure for our state that's, that's going to go on well beyond these three years. So I talk about the consortium and how it's in legislation. And again, this idea of 61 institutions working together in one consortium as a body to really address um, systemic issues to being able to access persist and complete higher education. Um, and I talk about um, the fact that ICCB and IBHE work together as partners to convene this um, consortium. Um, I talk about the advisory. Um, the advisory committee is chaired by five different state agencies, includes a six state agency and partners with them, also includes employers and legislators and advocates and others to guide the work of the consortium. And that's in our legislation and will exist and be part of this um, long-term infrastructure as we continue to work three years, five years, 10 years down the road to addressing um, access to higher education. So these are some of the long-term pieces that have been put in place to really build towards um, an equitable future um, in early childhood higher education. Um, there's another piece of the work that we have also put in place as we're thinking about um, the infrastructure, um, building towards um, the future, um, and, and really ensuring equity as we go forward. And that's our early childhood faculty preparation grants. Um, a few years ago, Tony Potenza and Marie Donovan came and did a presentation to, at the Higher Ed Forum about the need for um, not only to increase the pipeline of faculty, but to increase the diversity of faculty in our state and how important that is and also recognizing that we need to have more diverse faculty, more um, a larger pool of faculty, but we also need to have faculty that understand both early childhood and pedagogy, how to work with adult learners. And that's what this work is really about. So today we want to spend a little bit of time talking to you about the Early Childhood Faculty Preparation Grants. This work has just launched with four institutions who we'll introduce um, soon. Again, the primary goals of this work are to increase edu educational pipelines and increase the number of diverse early childhood faculty in Illinois. We know that if we are going to expand, um, you know, an additional 20,000 early childhood preschool slots in the state, we're going to need um, a lot more um, uh, teachers and assistant teachers, and we're going to need a lot more faculty to prepare those teachers and assistant teachers. Um, another goal of this work is to really provide the next generation faculty with knowledge, skills, and abilities, both in early childhood and pedagogy, and the ability to support adult learners. And then another really important piece of this work is to make sure that there are equitable opportunities um, for those candidates who want to be able to become early childhood faculty who may have not been able to um, access these pathways before due to financial, geographic, or other systemic barriers. Um, and some key features of the program, which our panel will talk about in, in a lot more detail, um, is really focused on how do we support working adults. Um, so when we put out an RFP for this work, a few things were really important to ECAs. Um, one, that we're providing working adults with an opportunity to move in to become early childhood faculty if this is a goal. We know we have some tremendous um, 
uh, directors, principals, program directors in early childhood that may want to advance in their career. So we wanted to make sure that there were opportunities to access coursework when and where they needed them, virtually with limited time on campus, but opportunities to interact as a community. We felt like it was really important, like our other ECAs work, to have someone supporting them on campus, whether it's a mentor or a coordinator, someone that can touch base with them, somebody that can help them you know, navigate the institution, navigate graduate work. Um, we just feel like this is a really important part of, you know, the philosophy behind ECAs and that we really want to carry that through to this piece of the work. Um, and then the other um, important feature of this work, um, like ECAs, is thinking about how we can help um, those candidates, you know, address, again, financial barriers. So we wanted to make sure there was funding for tuition and fees. Um, we wanted to make sure that there was opportunities for leadership development, professional development, and other resources and support. Those are really key um, components that we were looking for in these grants. Um, so we were able to provide grants to four institutions, Illinois State, University of Illinois Chicago, Lewis and National Lewis. Um, and so what we thought would be interesting today is to have those four institutions talk about the work as they have started to, to launch and the things that they're putting in place. Um, and Marsha Holly has been working with these institutions, and I'm going to turn it over to Marsha now to um, introduce herself and to, to moderate the panel. Thanks, Christy. It's um, it's truly my pleasure that I get to work together with these four institutions and the people who are putting together the program and thinking about it. Um, they're truly innovative. I think that's the key word for this. Uh, conference. Our forum is about innovation, and they really, uh, you know, are exemplify um, strong programs that will help to build the early childhood workforce with faculty in higher education um, with their specialized programs. Um, and what's really interesting is that they're all really different from one another, and they are um, are able to be able to show and showcase their innovation, um, their differences, and they're really exciting and interested um, to share it with you. But I wanna also share a little secret here is that we are, we're doing this in a really informal way because we believe in communities of practice that we work together and we share. And a lot of times we don't always know what everybody's doing. So the way that we're gonna do this is to share with you individually what each of this, these programs are doing, how they're approaching this early childhood faculty prep, and then we're gonna get into a conversation of sharing of those practices more specifically. So I'm gonna start by introducing them and then they'll be able to share their programs with you. And I'm gonna start with Miranda Lim um, from Illinois State University. Miranda? Hello, everyone. Um... I'm, I'm Miranda. I teach early childhood education at ISU, and we are very grateful to receive this funding to support a cohort of very diverse and talented candidates. Great. Miranda, do you want to tell a little bit more about why yours is, what are you doing, and where you are in this process? Um, we actually have more than 70 applications. We were very pleased with the outcome. Uh, we, I mean, we, we grouped students based on tier one, tier two, and et cetera. And we had more than 32 great candidates. And um, I'm grateful that the state was able to provide a little bit more funding. So we will have a cohort of 25 um, in-service teachers, mostly in CPS. Um, we do have two uh, dual language teachers in central Illinois. Um, they are diverse. They are diverse in so many different ways, and the average um, teaching years will be about ten point five years, and then the average GPA is about three point six. And some of them already presented at the state level conferences. Um, so they are on the way, on the path to become faculty for sure. Um, um, we 
do have one uh, book author in the cohort and um, and actually the candidates, they, they express their gratitude just like we did. Um, and I actually would like to share one quote from a candidate. Um, she sent me a message and she was saying that um, when she was taking classes at XYZ school, it was um, it was difficult because most professors were not bilingual and I would like to be that support for future teachers. And I feel that this is important for me to do. And many of them actually stated that without the financial support, without this grant funding, many of them will not get an advanced degree, even though they have the desire to, to become a faculty in a higher ed or become mentor teacher or teacher leaders in their district. Yeah, so we are, we are very grateful and we are looking forward to uh, enroll them um, as soon as next week. Just yeah. getting started. It's exciting. Yeah. So thanks, yeah. Miranda. Thank you. Sunny, can you share your program and um, its unique features at UIC? Sure. My name is Sunny Kim. Uh, I'm an associate professor at UIC and my colleague, Dr. Michelle Parker Katz clinical professor at UIC is also joining here as a co-program director of this grant program. We both are from the Department of Special Education and formal early childhood educators. Um, talking about our program, the main goal of UIC early childhood future faculty program is to recruit and retain a cohort of 18 early childhood future faculty in higher education to help train a diverse and culturally competent early childhood workforce. This is a four semesters master's program in instructional leadership policy studies and future faculty in our program will complete two semesters internships at community colleges and universities in Chicagoland with their faculty partners. Upon the completion of the program, they will also get UIC certificate in foundations of college instruction. We're intentionally recruiting diverse current early childhood educators who have at least 18 graduate credit hours in early childhood content and five years of work experience in early childhood setting to meet the minimum criteria to be higher education faculty in Illinois. Um, talking about application and admission process, um, during our application process, we reached out to the current or formal early childhood master's students at UIC about the possible program. Once awarded the grant, we sent out flyers to them and asked them to share. And we also reached out to our networks, including UIC social media, each department social media as well. And we prepared materials for uh, virtual information sessions, working with our instructional designer and open a public Google for folder to store those slides, a, group, uh, a document with FAQs and a folder for um, other general information and another for application directions. Potential applicants signed up for the sessions via Google form we called intent to apply. Using those data, we sent reminders and follow-ups for the sessions. Between January and uh, February 2023, we held three virtual information sessions. We held another virtual session in March to assist, uh, to assist applicants as they completed their applications. 107 people attended the sessions. Five, uh, 54 people completed the intent to apply. As of today, we have 34 applications submitted. Um, we developed an admission process that enabled choice, either writing the personal statement or making an audio file. We developed the work survey to collect in equitable ways that um, equi equitable ways what applicants' experience have been. We developed a rubric for rating all four admissions artifacts, including personal statement, work survey, transcripts, and reference recommendation letters. That's great. <laughs> and you have so many. Michelle, did you want to add anything? <laughs> oh. 
I wasn't ready. <laughs> um, good morning slash afternoon, depending on what your what your clock is saying, right? Um, um, I want to um, just add that um, I love working with my colleague Sunny, and we're so appreciative for this. I've been um, involved in teacher education at multiple levels for a number of years, and this is such an exciting project for for us to do and it's also a project that is giving us opportunities to develop new tools that will really authentically and genuinely invite diverse folks to share their expertise share their passion and become teacher educators of early childhood educators. And that is really exciting to somebody like me who's been in the field for a while. We're really making it happen with cross-department collaborations, with um, the internships, the two semester internships, and we're working with community and, and colleges and universities that are all minority serving and or HSIs. And we're making changes in recruitment and admission that we hope will be sustained. So thank you for this opportunity. We really appreciate it. That's it's great, Michelle. I was I'm glad that you spoke so highly about the specific ways that you're making changes in your institutions and um, the very different focus that I think you're you're using and having. So I'm going to share, um, I'm going to ask Rebecca Pruitt <laughs> at Lewis University to, sh to share her innovative approach to faculty preparation. Hi, everyone. So we are also very, very grateful for the opportunity to participate in this project and really believe that we're getting the chance to address an issue that has been brought to my attention for a number of years. Um, it's a barrier that I've heard about from my community college partners, and it has to do with uh, something that Dr. Brown, you talked about a little bit ago, uh, dual credit. So as you all know, whenever um, a, a high school uh, classroom teacher, teacher that is teaching child development or early childhood, a CTE instructor, um, when they are seeking dual credit um, for their class, that teacher um, who, who wants to offer dual credit must be uh, qualified as an adjunct instructor um, and follow the qualifications of HLC for that institution, for the partnering institution. And so it's something that we have encountered over the years at both the four-year level and the two-year level is um, teachers who have been teaching these classes who do not, um, e either they do not have a master's degree with at least 18 hours in early childhood, or um, they do not, or they have a master's degree, but it's in a related education field, and they do not have the early childhood education endorsement. So um, our project focuses on, um, on resolving that issue for at least 18 um, high school instructors in the state of Illinois. And so um, what they we, we've got two cohorts. They have started classes already. Um, we have one cohort of six. They are completing a master's degree. It's their first master's degree in early childhood education, our dual licensure program. And then we have um, a group of 12 who are completing the subsequent endorsement in early childhood. And so these teachers were recruited um, a pretty fast but um, very uh, rigorous process. So we reached out to everyone who teaches these classes in the whole state of Illinois, and they completed surveys, those that were interested. Uh, we have a fantastic uh, member of our team, Dr. Aaron Thompson, who uh, really managed that whole process. And included in the survey were questions um, about their own recruitment of a diverse class. Um, for these classes because the whole point is to uh, qualify teachers so that they can offer these classes as dual credit so that we are now addressing um, pipeline issues in early childhood with high school students and really looking to recruit a diverse population 
of early childhood educators moving forward. So they had to present us with a plan for how they were gonna recruit um, a really diverse um, class of students um, in their high schools. So what's unique about our project is that um, we're doing some partnering with community college faculty who are going to do mentoring on site at the high school. Um, the high school instructors are gonna also visit the community college, particularly if there is a child development lab school on campus that they could visit. So we're really kind of all hands on deck providing some hands on mentoring with these instructors so that um, that theory to practice connection is really being made and that, um, that they're really getting sort of a, a a, a deep uh, mentoring when it comes to uh, those early childhood practices. So um, we're also going to do some some summit um, experiences on campus where we're going to talk about dual credit and alignment of classes, um, uh, collaborate around that, and also provide some some you know more in person experiences for them to to um, practice what they're learning. So. Those are some of the unique features of what, what we're doing with our project. Great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. It's really fun to, to hear how different these programs are. And so I'm going to ask Leslie Catch and Lisa Dickey, who are both from National Lewis University, to share their program and their innovative features, as well as where they are right now in this exploration. So Leslie? Yeah, thank you, Marcia. Um, I'm Leslie Catch. I'm associate professor at National Lewis in the Early Childhood Education Department. I'm also here with Lisa Dickey, who is going to be the program manager for this grant, is the program manager and has been well underway in helping us get up and running. Um, we're just beginning recruitment in the next coming weeks, and we're excited to get started and um, really grateful for this opportunity that we can provide for our students. Um, this new early childhood faculty preparation master's program is a concentration and an outgrowth from our existing early childhood administration master's program that's actually been in existence for over 25 years and has been offered fully online for the last 11 years. So we'll continue in that modality as we have a lot of experience in running these high touch online programs. Um, for this concentration, faculty preparation concentration, we're keeping many of our core courses in early childhood content as well as some of our key leadership courses, and then also adding in 15 doctoral semester hours from our higher ed programs at National Lewis that are specifically focused on teaching in higher ed and adult learning, which we think will really be helpful in their preparation for walking into that higher ed um, teaching experience. We'll also include two quarter long internships with hands-on teaching experience that will be within our NLU undergraduate programs. Um, during this internship, they will have a faculty mentor and they'll be meeting in a seminar, weekly seminar, to reflect on their teaching and receive content from guest speakers and experts in the field of early childhood. We'll have a full-time learning and writing support specialist dedicated to just this cohort of students that will be working in tandem with the program manager, assessing problems along the way and really trying to identify some of those common barriers that we see for program completion for our early childhood students. And I'm really excited that our Dean of NCE, National College of Education, is gonna consider this somewhat of a pilot program, looking at how a full-time dedicated support specialist just for early childhood students um, can really benefit from this type of wraparound service. So she's gonna, we're gonna be collecting data as we plan to anyway, and hoping to kind of present that as a way to add this into our budget for going forward and get this support for all of our early childhood students. So we believe this is gonna be a really key aspect towards their successful completion. Um, the students can apply up to nine semester hours of prior credit for prior learning to help complete this program within 12 months. And we think that's gonna be a key factor for their successful completion and rather a short timeline. Um, and then lastly, a key component that we think is gonna be really attractive to students is they can apply those 15 semester hours of doctoral coursework towards one of our doctoral programs at NLU. And they'll be guaranteed an interview um, to help encourage them to continue on and consider continuing their education to really expand their ability to teach in diverse settings outside of just community college and undergraduate to maybe move into even some of those four-year universities and um, the graduate level. I think that summarizes our program up till now. Thanks, that's great. Lisa, what do, do you wanna add anything to that in terms of your role and, and coming into this work? 
<laughs> yeah, it's been very exciting and we it's been very fast as well. Um, but we are very excited to start recruiting students. And I think it's going to be an exciting opportunity for um, many students that have already been exposed to National Lewis, but also students that were um, trying to um, find in different areas as well that may benefit from a fully online program. Yeah, I think it's going to be the hardest part is trying to limit it to people in Illinois and who want to are going to remain teaching in Illinois. But it still is such an opportunity that you've presented. I'm a little curious. I'm going to um, ask you, Miranda, your program really addresses, and I loved the quote that you gave um, for somebody who really wants to be a part of your program. But you talk about how your plan really is to build the knowledge and skills in teaching multilingual students, the learners, and then the community engagement piece that you're planning to make sure you install in your program. I mean, ISU doesn't have a master's degree in early childhood education, and that's why we have to create new courses for this cohort. Um, we gather data, I mean, information from ISU's urban center that they, they actually ask CPS teachers what their needs, and um, so we will be able to tailor the courses um, to meet the needs of this cohort. And I, I believe ISU has a great um, support system in place um, because we, we, we have we already hired a GA um, to support students writing because we have a lot of um, uh, half of the candidate in this in this cohort needs uh, a little bit more support in terms of their writing skills, and we already have a GA in place, and we have a student success coach that work with me um, and we will have like a weekly meeting virtual meeting with the students um, we also plan to have um, pd virtual pd and in-person conferences on campus um, we also have social events that we plan for the student and isu i already asked the president's office I got a little bit funding to support the first social event in Chicago in June so at ISU is on board and I mean we, we were just so uh so grateful and thrilled that we you know we we will be able to support this uh this cohort um who actually are so they've so when I met with them last week they were so excited they, they were just like, and they are actually, they, they wanted to support each other. And, and that's what I told them. Yes, this is the person we would like to have in this cohort. You have to support each other as teachers. That's what we do, right? So, and also, we also have this, um, the criteria to teach courses for this cohort. I have to handpick the faculty that have gone through the urban course redesign which means they have they have gone through this one week cultural immersion um, experience in Chicago in the past. So I mean, we we are trying everything we can to better meet the needs of this cohort. I'm uh, I'm I'm not um, envious of you having to make your final selection based on your applicants as well as. Um, all of the things that you're trying to do uh, to build that sense of community within with the students. So I, I'm really looking forward. And as I'm sure everybody who's listening in right now is to, to hear what you're learning and how that all works. Yeah. Um, and, you know, everybody has like different ways of doing things. And I, I'm really curious to hear about how uh, Michelle and Sonny at um, UIC, um, you had described in, in our first meeting how you used tools that you're using to like really address racialized in inequities and thinking about how to do that. And um, just wondering how you plan to do that with mentoring, uh, faculty mentoring and support and what you really are planning to do now that you're in the implementation phase and thinking through how it's gonna work. 
Um, so I'll start talking and 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 Sunny um, will add in. We prepared these comments um, together. Um, we we have four areas or domains of tools that um, that we're developing or have developed so far um, to to address the inequities um, in in learning, in recruiting, and of course, in getting people into, uh, into doing teacher education um, for early childhood. And so those four areas are changes in recruitment and admissions, um, changes related to the kinds of field work that we provide for learning that. So um, what we're calling internships and um, a few other programs are doing the same. A third area we mentioned is cross-departmental collaboration. And a fourth area, like another program is doing, is um, exposing our candidates to doctoral coursework, too, and supporting that. Um, so just some pieces in each of the areas. In recruitment and admission, we mentioned how uh, we um, push to have people not have to write um, their personal statement, but be able to record it. Um, we also personalized for our program the um, personal statements. So we have them addressing question, a main question of um, their experiences serving diverse populations in urban inclusive settings and also talking about their aspirations for becoming teacher educators, for working in higher ed. Um, and we also, as we uh, mentioned, developed this work survey so that we could look across in fair and equitable ways about what people have done. With the internships, um, we've reached out through using ECA's um, partnerships we reached out to uh, community colleges and universities, we're still in the midst of doing that, um, who are minority serving um, um, and often HSI. And we're trying to, um, when, when we get all those reach outs, um, match folks, um, create connections um, that will address local knowledge and also the need um, to really think about racial and cultural diversity. What, what we're really saying here is we recognize that there are very nuanced funds of knowledge um, that will support allyship with our students you know, in their cohort and in their work with faculty partners and community colleges and universities and will also support their future work with students in community colleges and in universities and helping them work with people in communities and um, helping them work with their students' families. So sort of developing a layered way of looking at this. Yeah, you are you are taking the parallel process to <laughs> An extreme, and I really like that that idea. Sunny, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Are you okay? Thanks. I think that's <laughs> just. I I I think the two of you who are working through some of these, like how do we, how are we equitable in our own approach to selection? How are we going to make ensure that everything that we're learning and what we're doing that we're making sure that that carries forward into the program that they are doing as well as how they will treat other students. So really like that idea. Um, I'm gonna ask a, a question of you, Rebecca, in terms of, you know, you've described what you're doing, which is a very innovative approach to building our faculty as well as building the population of people who will be our teachers simultaneously. And, um, I wondered if you would share a little bit on how you imagine this will really impact the field um, for those who will continue their studies beyond high school, you know, and go into college. And um, 
and and simultaneously, you know, if we're talking about the parallel process, how will this affect the way that the people who are currently teaching high school, how will that impa impact them? Well, I'm hopeful that um, the impact will be that we will see an actual increase in the number of individuals who choose early childhood as a profession, as a career. I'm hopeful that that group will be more diverse than in years past. Um, I'm hopeful that this project will impact these uh, future faculty, right? So they'll become adjunct faculty at multiple institutions. I'm hopeful that this experience will actually um, challenge some of, you know, some of where people have maybe become stagnant, uh, maybe have been teaching some of this content for some time, um, that maybe they'll be a little bit challenged, um, particularly in some of the areas that we've been discussing here today, and uh, that they will begin to think um, in new ways and um, continue to move forward in their understanding of early childhood curriculum and environments and families and, and in all of those areas. So we're really hopeful that this will be a collaboration that will um, grow a, a new group of um, adjunct faculty um, who could maybe even teach beyond their high school classes and maybe move into um, higher education contexts as well in the future, if that's something they're looking at. It sounds really, it sounds like a, a really good way of thinking about like the hopes and the vision that you have. So I, I, I really appreciate that. It's like, gives me such hope in general. So thanks. Um, I'm going to ask Leslie and Lisa to share a little bit about, you know, you talked, you talked about how your, um, one of the things that you're offering is that part of your coursework will will be part of someone's doctoral program if they so choose to move on. Um, and I wondered if you think that when you're starting your recruitment efforts, which will begin, did you say next week? Ideally, yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> higher ed, some of these things, they tick along, but yeah, we're like right there. We're on the, on yeah, the what are you line. hoping or thinking that this might be a value add for some of the the students who would apply and who might want to be a part of this. Because as you know, I mean, this might be a great way to begin your career into higher education, but, but then what next? Do you think that that's going to impact people's desire to be part of your, your faculty prep program? Yeah, I, I hope so. I think so based on, and really we added this in based on our experience of um, the students we have going through our master's programs that many of them come in with many years of experience teaching or being a director in a leadership position and they're ready to um, kind of engage in the in the profession in a further reaching manner and they talk about wanting to teach and they see this as the next step and sort of the master's degree is sort of testing the waters into higher ed, knowing that it will give them possibly an avenue into teaching. But our other program is not specifically geared to teaching them how to teach in higher ed. And I think that's what's so cool about this program, because many master's and doctoral programs don't teach you how to teach in higher ed. I mean, we get out of our doctoral programs and we kind of learn on the fly. And maybe you've had an internship in teaching, hopefully. But I think what's so unique about this is that we're teaching them how to teach, but then also giving them those doctoral classes that are about higher ed. One of the courses is higher ed in, in the United States. What's it mean? How do you survive in a higher ed institution? How can you navigate it, especially as a diverse person in this world? So um, I think that will be of a key attraction, but then also knowing that many of our students look towards doctoral programs. They talk to me about that. Well, where should I go next? I want to use this towards something. So already walking out of this program with those 15 semester hours is a huge benefit financially and time-wise if they choose to go on to pursue their doctoral um, degree. And, and ideally they could use it at other institutions, you know, as well, if they don't just stay at NLU towards our doctoral program is that they'll have those, some of those core base courses that they could transfer to another institution. Um, and just in my in, informal talking to people who have asked about the program, they go, oh my goodness, they hear that part and say, wow, or I, or they already have done, they said, I wish that I had this when I was going through my master's program. So 
um, yeah, we're anticipating it's going to be a very attractive piece of our program. I think so too. And I wondered um, either you, Leslie, or Lisa, um, what do you anticipate some of those goals to, for the people? You're, I, I hope you're ready to have an influx of applications as I think others have described what it was like to try to have to you know, select from a large pool. What are you anticipating will the that you'll find in the people who will apply? Um, well, yeah, and Lisa, if you want to jump in, I think I think similar to what I was um, just mentioning that I we have already get some of this flavor from our students that are applying to our master's in early childhood administration is that their desire to teach in higher ed. Mm -hmm. um, and even if they don't have that when they're entering the program, many of them talk to me about it on the exit of the program. Well, now this has really piqued my interest into teaching in higher ed, um, trying to think of how they expand. And many of them, they don't want to leave what they're doing, but they want to they want to give back in this other way. So doing some adjunct teaching um, at their local community college are ways that they can really help prepare this next generation of, of the people they have coming to work for them. Many of them are directors and they see a need to um, really improve that quality of education for the, for the teachers that they're hiring and they want to be a part of that. Um, so I, you know, we're, we're going to prioritize people who obviously have that desire to teach and specifically um, express a desire to teach in higher ed because that's really what the program is geared towards. So I think, um, and, and as we appreciate the encouragement that we're going to have people lined up, but you always, there's always that fear you're going to put it out and nobody's going to come, right? So it's been really helpful to hear from the other programs who have had such success and interest. So we're, we're hopeful that it is going to garner a lot of interest. And obviously the financial support is key for these students who it really is a hardship. It really, it really takes a lot. And the return on investment, as we know, is, is really not great at all for higher ed and, and, um, and early childhood ed education. So I think this is um, such a benefit to the field. Thanks. Thanks so much. And I'm I'm looking at the time and I know we went a little bit over, but I really wanted to, I know everybody wanted to hear a little bit more. So we don't have time for questions. Um, and I'm wondering, Christy, after you've heard all of this, what are your thoughts as somebody who's leading the ECA's effort? Um, I mean, I thought this was a really exciting presentation. I, I know about some of these pieces, but to hear everybody talk about it and you know what they're seeing even this early in the work is really just exciting. Um, some of the things that particularly struck me were um, just this, this real focus on diversity and equity and ensuring that candidates have opportunities to move into programs that they, they may or may not have had before. Um, and really, I, I heard from each of you the importance of making sure students are successful and doing that in a variety of different ways. You know, like each program looks very different, but how important that is and that you've been thinking about that from the beginning. Um, one of the other things that um, I love is the partnerships. Um, and there's so many different partnerships in this work and they all look a little bit differently, like whether it's sort of an internal institution partnership of doing something interesting, creative, whether it's a partnership with community college, whether it's a partnership with other institutions, whether it's a partnership between, you know, graduate and undergraduate or graduate doctoral programs, there's just with high schools, there's just so many different pieces. Um, and then again, this community practice that Marsha has really pulled together to have each, you know, everybody learn from one another. Um, and then, you know, one of the other things that I also really appreciate it is that the way this program is set up provides so many different opportunities. You know, un unfortunately, because of the short nature of this grant and the work and all that stuff, we can't get everybody through a doctoral program, but we can get them through a master's program. But the way that so many folks have set up their program will allow them to do so many things when this program is done, either, you know, exit, go back to their current program, stay in their current program, do some adjuncting on the side maybe become a full-time adjunct, maybe be a faculty in a community college, an instructor in a community college, or um, a position in a four-year institution, do some professional development work, or go continue to go on into a doctoral program, either now or in a few years. Um, and so really providing that opportunity and really expanding that pool. Um, and I'm really excited to think about um, what all these uh, what all the candidates will do and um, uh, look like and their experiences and their education from now. 
um, when everybody comes through, because I think that this is just a really important part of, of really building an equitable future for, for our state. So thank you um, to the whole panel for your time. And Marsha, I wanted to provide you an opportunity to, to say a few words. And then I also wanted to acknowledge Stephanie Bernatite, because when all of the planning was going forward with this whole initiative, um, Stephanie kept saying, we, we, we need to do a grant for faculty. We need to do a grant for diverse faculty. And everybody was like, what? And, no, 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 no. We need to. Um, and so it was really her passion that really um, sort of was the seed um, to this as well. So yeah, Marcia, actually, you know, Christy, I was, I was going to say exactly that just because um, without Stephanie's vision for this happening. And then we, we really wondered how it would how it would roll out and what people would do. And I am just so delighted that these four different approaches are so directly targeted to meet the needs of diverse faculty in early childhood, which, as you know, it's really hard to find. And so really appreciate all the work that you're putting in and your willingness to grapple with this. And I know how much work it is to do this. So Thank you all for presenting this information to everyone. And thank you for the extra time, those who stayed. Thanks. To you, Joni. I know, I was waiting to see if Stephanie had anything else to add in there. All right. Thank you very much, Christy. Thank you, Marcia, and the entire panel. We really, uh, really appreciated everything. So we are going to take a lunch break here. I know everyone's anxious for that, right? I want to tell you to please leave your computers on. Just go off video. We're going to resume promptly at 1245. Um, and I just want to say one more time, thank you so much, Marcus, for agreeing to address questions tomorrow morning that came in today to ICCB. You're, you have Helped us get back on track time-wise, Marcus. So thank you so much for your flexibility. All right, I'm looking forward to seeing all of you at 12:45. Go take a break. Thank you.
We'll get started in just a moment. Oh. 
All right, Julie, I have 12.45. What do you have? Same. All yes. right. That was a quick lunch break, folks. But what I hope is you grabbed your lunch, something to snack on, and you're back uh, able to see your laptop computer or to listen in. Uh, and please do continue having a lunch break here while we get the forum back up and running for our afternoon. So to set the stage for the next segment of faculty sharing, I have a quick question for all of you. How many of you remember Voices from the Field? This was published in 2016, a book from just a few years ago, and I kind of picked it up the other day and I was flipping through it and it really struck me how clearly the recommendations and suggestions of faculty from a range of institutions when this was uh, published in 2016 were highlighted in that were highlighted in that book are actually being implemented today. So Voices from the Field, those of you who remember, there were segments, chapters on the need to expand and build new pathways for the workforce. Sections of the book highlighted the critical need for a better system of articulation and transfer of all associate degrees. It really called out the need to recognize and utilize the CDA. Uh, it talked about the need to provide tools and resources to really build out an assessment infrastructure for Gateway's credentials. It talked about the need to expand workforce capacity to serve children who are English language learners. And it also suggested that institutions could and should evolve in delivery systems to better meet workforce needs. Many of you shared viewpoints in that book, a lot of you who are with us today. And now in looking back, I think it really kind of foreshadowed aspects of work that have been undertaken during these last seven years. And some of these ideas are actually what faculty will also be showcasing in this next session of today's agenda. So let's start our faculty showcase with Dr. Nancy Latham. Nancy is the Associate Dean of the College of Education at University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And just to kind of keep this everything concise today, although Nancy's with us live, we also what we'll be showcasing here is a video clip of Nancy sharing information. Nancy was one of the editors of Voices from the Field. Nancy? Hello, my friends. My name is Nancy Latham. I am at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, I was asked today to talk to you a little bit about where we are on the I IPEC competencies project and just kind of bring everybody up to speed on that. Um, I'm going to try to do that in five minutes. Most of you know I can talk really fast, so we'll see if I can do that. Um, just to give you a little overview, the, many of you, many of you uh, lended your expertise and served in this project and in the G5 work that followed. But you know, the project, the purpose of this was to, it was time to review and refine uh, and revise the Illinois professional teaching standards. There are about 250 of those. Uh, and so this project was to look at those, bring those to more of a competency model. And at the same time, also, if you remember in the, there was another part of rule where social emotional standards kind of sat, they still technically sit there, but um, we brought, that work more into these competencies and, and interwove it as opposed to the standalone social emotional standards that were really for learners. Uh, we, we designed those for teachers. So that was part of this as well. The original phase one task force had about uh, 25 folks that served that year. It was a full year uh, all across the state, uh, higher ed, pre-K-12, pre-K-12 admin, um, professional ed and orgs, unions, et cetera. And then in phase two, the last two years, we added about 100 plus members in each of the licensure areas um, and many, many of you served on that and helped us with that work and, and we were so thankful. Um, so what we've got now is a revised competency framework. That competency framework is made up of five areas. The first one is, is learning environment uh, that has nine specific competencies in it that are all aligned to relevant standards. Uh, even in different content areas, there are performance descriptors, there are look for specific to each licensure area as well. The second competency area is instruction. There are 19 competency areas in that um, in that part of the framework all aligned again as well. The third area is the uh, instructional assessment competency bucket as we uh, nicknamed them. There are 15 competencies in that area again all are aligned. 
The fourth area is collaboration and communication. There are seven competencies, defined competencies in that area. And then the last one is um, professional expectations and, and professional growth. And there are four competencies in that area for a total of 54 competencies, which I hope that folks find that a lot cleaner, a lot easier to measure um, in, in not only being updated and revised as well, but going from that 256 plus to this 54, we hope people find um, easier to use and hopefully align with as well. So in February of 21, um, that work was done and alignment tables were finalized, aligning these new 54 competencies with NTAS, IPTS, NACI, uh, CEC, gateways, et cetera, all of those. In fall of 21, draft rule language and a final report were given to ISBE. Uh, in the spring of 23, ISBE worked that through the rule process. And in the spring of 23, as you all are well aware, this past spring, these were adopted into rule. And uh, what that rule says is that by the fall of 25, specifically October 1st of 25, all programs must be aligned. And we're, uh, ISBE is still getting that process out to programs, I believe, but uh, it must be aligned. And by spring of 24, though, in June of 24, any program revisions or new programs that are coming to ISBE would already need to be aligned. And so um, just kind of to uh, give you an idea of that timeline. You know, there's always more work to do. So uh, we're, we're hoping to see regional working sessions set up by ISBE to support programs and the program alignment work, giving them what they have already aligned with with IPTS. We now have the alignment to this, making those alignments easier. Um, looking at competency protocol, evaluation protocol, how that will work and look like. We did develop performance descriptor language, measurement language, um, rubric, kinds of language that could be used by programs, uh, hopefully, and then even vertical expansion of the competency. So, you know, if we're, if we've developed competencies and said, this is what the competency teacher, competent teacher should be able to do on their first day. That's basically what these 54 describe. Well, we really, there could be work done. We're hoping that says, um, that means that if, if this is what a competent teacher should be able to do on their first day, then perhaps we could look at those 54 and a version of those could also be used to describe what a competent paraprofessional should be able to support, right? Because they're supporting those at that exact competency in the same classrooms. So what does that look like for the paraprofessional? And then what does it also look like for perhaps the teacher coach or mentor that are coaching and mentoring to that competency? What does it look like for the teacher leader who, who's leading to that competency? And, and of course, even building admin and program administration as well. And so uh, that's our hope. Uh, this is kind of a framework, a model of what we did, all the phases that we went through. And you can see that I was kind of describing that phase four here. Uh, so if you, hopefully you all have that information and that's getting out there from ISB and you're, you're already talking to your programs about that as well. Many of you were involved in the G5 to Pell work that was coming in closely as this was wrapping up. So we were really doing a balancing act. But basically with that work, um, we were looking at how we could bridge from a Gateways 5 credential to an early childhood Pell. And so we looked at the 54 competencies these th that we are responsible to in a professional educator license for early childhood. We looked at those 54 competencies and we looked at those against the existing G5 competencies. We did a deep analysis, as many of you know, ended up we identified 17 um, Illinois professional educator licensure competencies that were not fully aligned in that G5 and six that needed to be strengthened at the K-12 level. So meaning they were there, but they were very in the gateways, but they were very um, preschool or zero to five focus. And we needed to make sure that was extended in order to do the professional educator license. Um, and so 23, we identified um, 23 competencies and five learning journeys were developed that are now out there. Uh, wonderful tools in this project. All of the experts across the state that served on these committees in this group and contributed it was an amazing amount of work and these modules, what was created, the material, whether you use the modules or you use the materials or you add your own or you do incredible material ready for you and ready for programs to adopt to develop these G5 uh, licensure programs or uh, bridges to licensure, uh, hopefully. So, you know, I, a, lot, a lot of you were involved in that where we, we we looked at those projects, we analyzed those gaps, we explored licensure requirements, and then we created these modules, as I said. The learning journeys, the learning journeys that were created were in instructional planning, assessments, and environment. There was one in science, one in math, 
one in social studies, one in literacy, one in professionalism and collaboration. Those all cover those identified 23 bridging competencies. And then there were toolboxes to also assist programs in supporting and bridging, which were EdTPA guidance toolboxes, test taking skills and content and test review as well. So with the way we're doing this as a recording, I can't ask you if you have any questions, but I think most of you know how to get a hold of me. If you have any questions at all, please reach out. I'm happy to chat, happy to connect you to people, uh, those experts that were so involved and that can give you all the help you need. So I hope you have a wonderful conference and uh, let me know if you need any, have any questions. Super. Thank you so much, Nancy. Nancy and Dr. Kira Hammond, along with national partners, facilitated and guided faculty, as Nancy just shared, in building the CCE Level 5 to Pell Bridge. So about half our institutions to date have accessed that bridge curriculum and toolboxes, which is really great news. But I want to just remind you that faculty are welcome to use as much or as little of these tools and resources as they wish. And as uh, Nancy just said, the time is now, right? and very much is intended for a broader use at the state with the recent changes that ISBE's made, I would say this is perfect timing to have access to this, uh, these tools in this curriculum. Contact Stephanie Helmer here at INCRA if you would like to gain access. Stephanie's name, email is there on the screen. If you forget or you're trying to figure out later who you need to be in touch with, just reach out to myself, reach out to Julie, we'll connect you with Stephanie. So uh, we want to make sure everyone has access to it. All right, Dr. Judson Curry, the Dean of Office of Instruction at Kishwaukee College, is joining us to share how his institution is using an entire suite of resources to really develop programs that support students at Kishwaukee College. Judd, one of the things I really appreciate is just your excitement over the materials that have been developed through faculty partnerships and the way in which Kishwaukee is utilizing those. So Judd, over to you. Hi, my name is Judd Curry. I'm a dean at Kishwaukee College, and one of the areas that I supervise is early childhood education. And I wanted to take a minute to share with you some of the benefits that we've found in using the Gateways ECE Toolbox, which is available on the Gateways website. You can see here the Gateways website, and to get to the toolbox, you simply go to Professional Development, Higher Education Programs, and then ECE Toolbox. The Toolbox is essentially a repository of uh, really valuable resources, um, tools that will help you um, apply the Gateway's competencies in your courses. It gives you tools for um, understanding the competencies, um, assessing the competencies, and activities that students can do to demonstrate those competencies. So as you scroll down the Toolbox website, um, the first thing you'll come to is a collection of videos that are available. These videos will give you background on how the competencies were developed, um, how to make use of the competencies, um, and how to map curriculum to the competencies. You can watch them individually from here, or you can simply go to the YouTube playlist and play through them. Um, in any order you like. As you move down, uh, you'll see that the toolbox is organized around the seven gateways content areas. Um, and the uh, competency assessment guide is a document that will give you valuable information on how to incorporate the competencies um, into your courses, how the competencies fit into the um, uh, the Gateways credentialing framework, um, and uh, it's a great background read, something that you can take a look at as you uh, get started. Moving down here, you'll come to the uh, content areas, and each of these content areas can be expanded, and when you expand it, you'll find a whole set of resources related to activities that students can do and additional resources available um, in order to demonstrate the various competencies. If you were to, we're looking at the health, safety, and well-being content area here, and the child health and program profile um, is an activity, and if you were to click on that, it would take you to 
um, this document, which allows you to uh, provide students with an activity to assess uh, level two competencies. So HSW1 and HSW2 describes what the competencies are. It describes what the assessment task is, um, helps set up what students will be doing during that task. It provides um, rubrics that, that faculty can use to assess students um, in completing those tasks. And then it provides tools that the student can use while completing that task. Uh, this is an incredible package, something that, that faculty can take advantage of, that you can build into courses um, that will really ensure that you are getting the best possible assessment of your students' competencies in those areas. You also have access to the Master Rubric site here, which provides you with um, master rubric information for assessing all of the competencies in each of those uh, content areas in the form of a Word document. Um, that Word document will include um, uh, the various competency areas color-coded by level, so level two, three, four, or five. It will include uh, rubrics for assessing those competencies. Some of the rubrics are checklists to determine um, whether the student is demonstrating competence in that area. Some of the rubrics are in the form of um, uh, identifying what constitutes um, levels of competency in that area, whether it's unacceptable demonstration to developing, to competent, to distinguished, um, and color-coded according to the level. Moving further down, you'll find additional resources, uh, further videos, links to um, higher education forums and other interest sessions. This toolbox has been really valuable as we have worked to ensure that our courses are aligned with the competencies and that the work that our faculty are doing are really moving students um, into uh, more competent practitioners based on the Gateways framework. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Jed. There are truly a wealth of resources, and I'm really um, happy to also share that we have had literally tens of thousands of hits on those resource pages. It is so exciting to see that these resources and tools are being used. This is a visual for you to look at real quickly here of the competency kind of based interlocking structure of Gateway's credentials. You remember I referenced uh, the, a few minutes ago, Voices from the Field, those epi grants that drove that. Um, one of the results of that epi grant was the faculty impetus to move Gateway's credentials over to competency. So I would have to say thank you to all of you for that. Because if you kind of think of Lego blocks, the structure is pretty easy to see how the competencies build on each other how one set of competencies can equal a credential level. What you're looking at here are the 56 competencies that comprise the level five ECE credential as tied to a BA degree. Kind of one block is one competency here on screen. And as Jed just shared, there are toolboxes, resources for all faculty to use. Moving on, what you see next then is the same picture, but a marker or a line here that kind of indicates um, the level two credentials. So below that line, it's a visual of everything below the green line are the competencies which comprise the ECE level two credential. And that if you add more knowledge and do more skill building competencies as evidenced through uh, additional coursework, let's go on to the next, there you go, next slide here with these additional lines, you can see how an individual advances to gain from the level two to the three, they move, move up to secure level four, and then they get to the ECE credential level five, which requires, of course, meeting all of the competencies. Collaborative groups of faculty worked really hard in 2020 to design segments or modules of competency-based education curriculum for the entire ECE credential suite of competencies. Then in 2021, that curriculum was tested around the state by lots of colleges and universities and literally hundreds of students. Throughout the piloting, both students and faculty provided a lot of great input that informed revisions. And then we released it to everyone. You all probably remember last year, early in 2022. We talked about that at last year's forum and we have quite a few institutions who have accessed and are using these curriculum modules. 
But one of our key projects then last year in 2022 was to take the ECE level two competency curriculum modules, translate them into Spanish, and then embed Spanish resources and then test it. Partnering institutions in this work included College of Lake County, National Lewis and Western Illinois University. They and their students piloted or tested all of this Spanish curriculum. So let's hear more about that work from a faculty colleague. Here to join us today is Marcela Calderon Duran. She is an early childhood Spanish instructor at College of Lake County, Marcela. Hello, my name is Marcela Calderon Duran and I work for College of Lake County and we were lucky enough to pilot a program for early childhood education level two completely in Spanish. And when I heard about this program, I got very excited because this is something that I'm passionate about. Um, helping others continue their education, yet this was very specific for those students that only spoke Spanish. And we saw the need when we started to promote this program and and we had an opportunity to open it up to a Zoom meeting. And my colleague and I had approximately 80 people interested in such a program. And some of the comments that the people were telling us was, we had been waiting for this. Why hadn't it happened before? They were very excited to hear about it because they wanted to continue their education, yet there was that barrier, that language barrier that was not allowing them to continue. So when they heard about this program they decided they wanted to start and when they were accepted and when they started the whole thing it was such an excitement for them and also for us to see how many people were first of all motivated to start and coming back uh, uh to coming back to school after so many years, for some of them, they had been out of school for years. They had finished their either their GED or their high school a very long time ago. So it was kind of like the comeback after so many years. So that was exciting for them. And that was a new experience for us. And also it was really nice to see them go through the modules. All of the modules were highly, um, designed for students that spoke Spanish. First of all, the videos were in Spanish. The vocabulary was high academic Spanish. The explanations, the websites that were used, everything was completely done thinking of them, not in a sense of translation, but with a sense and uniqueness that a community of, spe of Spanish speaking learners are going to need. So that was really nice for them to see and to experience. And the comments that we got from that is of course that, you know, they, they really felt like they were going through college, you know, as you know, with a high academic level to the point where sometimes, you know, they needed a little bit of extra support to be able to understand that but that really comes naturally when you have learners that have all of the of the practice and all of these experiences and they are able to connect it with a theory which was really nice to see it was beautiful to see that journey for them to be able to make those connections of real life situations that they live and being able to complete it and connect it to the theory they were learning through the the pilot program the other thing that we uh, noticed through this whole process was the need for the community to be able to see that there was a sense of validation for who they were because a lot of these people had been wanting this program yet there there wasn't th that opportunity so being able to bring this to them and be able to share it with the community brought a sense of validation of who they are and what they bring to their communities and a lot of my students would mention in their their reflection papers in their projects that they were excited to share with their colleagues. They were excited to take it back and apply it with the children they were working with. They were excited to share with their leaders to kind of share new ideas and be able to participate and integrate even more and bring more to the table. So that was a great experience for us to see. And nevertheless, some of the reflections that I got at the end, I asked my students to record themselves and tell me the 
benefits of this program and the stories that I have heard continue to motivate me about, you know, adding more of these type of programs um, in our institutions. Some of the reflections mentioned that they wanted to continue their education, that they were interested in going back to school to either another certification to continue learning to continue uh, being actively involved in an institution a learning institution where they were going to be able to bring something back so the fact is our are the individuals that went through this program not only are they receiving for them but they are also going back to their communities and sharing with their communities what they have learned Thank you so much, Marcella. That was very well stated. Uh, it was quite an exciting pilot. These Spanish ECE Level 2 uh, competency-based education curriculum modules will be available to all interested institutions. What you need to do is contact Stephanie Helmer here at INCRA. We are just so excited about this availability. All right, um, this view kind of shows us uh, quickly here how Gateway's credentialing system is kind of designed. Once you have a foundation of early childhood knowledge, once that's been attained as evidenced by holding like an ECE credential, then specializations can be added on. So in this picture, what you see is how, for example, the family child care or the infant toddler or the ESL and bilingual credential, any or all, could be added on as a specialization through taking additional coursework to the already existing ECE credential. So each one of these specializations, of course, has its own set of competencies, resources, and toolboxes on the Gateways website. But as I shared this morning, um, INCRA receives a, a, well, actually, we didn't get to share that, did we? All right, let me just tell you this news then. INCRA gets a huge number of applications from the workforce uh, for the most popular of our specialization credentials, which is the Gateways Infant Toddler credential. So um, in 2021, faculty came together and designed competency-based education curriculum for the infant toddler credential. Then in 2022, robust statewide testing of this curriculum was completed. And here to share details on this work is Jenna Kim, who's chair of the Department of Education at Roosevelt University. Gina. Hello, I am Gina Kim, Chair of the Department of Education and the Director of the Early Childhood Program at Roosevelt University. It was a great opportunity to receive the Infant Toddler Competency Modularization First and then an Implementation Grant. This grant allowed the Roosevelt University Early Childhood Program to create an innovative infant toddler online competence implementation program to increase and support a group of ethnically diverse assistant teachers in the community-based organization by Horizons Child Care Centers. Roosevelt University has a partnership with Bright Horizons. So when I received this grant, uh, I uh, reached out and with the help of from my former dean um, talking about, uh, I would like to create a, uh, a program for infant toddler teachers. And actually Brian Fragens wanted us to have us recruit assistant teachers to uh, support them. So with the effort to increase the knowledge of skills of early childhood teachers, especially infant toddler teachers, this grant allowed me to recruit 20 AAS or CDA credential assistant teachers from eight centers in the Chicago areas, Arlington Heights, Lake Bluff, Witten, and Peoria. Um, so by doing it, I, would, uh, I wanted to recruit these teachers to continue to come to Roosevelt University to earn their early childhood appeal and BA degree by providing um, them with peer A credits by using 15 chosen selected infant toddler competence modules. So as I said, 15 infant toddler competency modules were selected and implemented during the fall 2022 semester, um, both uh, traditional groups in at Roosevelt University and this group, um, Bright Horizons um, 
assistant teachers. Of 20, 18 participants completed all 15 competency modules and passed them higher or at competent levels on the 15 modules. I also asked at the end of the semester of the fall 2022 to uh, give us evaluation on the program. So from reviewing their program evaluation, many participants indicated that their knowledge of infant toddler curriculum and program has increased, especially uh, they talked about families and cultural diversity, early intervention, uh, and how to incorporate cultures and values into their classroom and centers. Read about the amount of work that they had to put in it each week, but I was very surprised that they were satisfied and happy with the program and then especially infant toddler uh, competency modules. So thank you for this wonderful opportunity to be a part of infant toddler competency project. And I would like to say that we must continue to support our future teachers and in-service teachers. So thank you so very much for um, giving me the opportunity to talk about our Roosevelt University uh, online Bright Horizons competency program. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for representing this work. As you can see on screen, eight institutions from around the state helped create and pilot the infant toddler modules. The full report is available on the Gateways website as noted above, and these modules will be available for all interested institutions. Contact Julie Lindstrom. And I know you all have Julie's email because you received a registration for uh, the forum today. Now from one of our, um, uh, excuse me, I was, jumping ahead of myself. Another collaborative project that included about, I think about a third, maybe 35% of all our institutions in the state was back in 2021 when faculty helped design scenarios which could be used to access the ECE credential entry level competencies through a prior learning assessment. So this statewide highly innovative uh, PLA project really focused on just the ECE level two competencies. It uses cutting edge technology that is very accessible for the workforce and it gives our incumbent early care and education workforce members the capacity to be assessed on their knowledge and skills to potentially meet up to any number of these ECE level two competencies. This groundbreaking work was tested in 2022. And right now in 2023, our partnering institutions are really working on what are the next steps to support statewide scale up. You can um, learn more about this at the afternoon session um, with Marie Donovan and Ann Brennan on what a difference a year makes uh, in that workshop. But also today from one of our partnering institutions, here we have Dr. Lindsay Meeker. She is from Western Illinois University. And Lindsay's gonna share a little bit about how this rolled out at WIU. We're searching platforms, so sometimes it just takes a few seconds here. So I have to be honest, when I first started with prior learned assessment, I thought this isn't gonna work. Um, I need to be in classrooms, seeing, hearing, feeling, to understand um, kind of the level that that learner is at. But I was wrong. So as we navigated into prior learned assessment and I was able to be involved in the, the scenario writing process and then pilot with the scoring and also the Spanish bilingual scoring, I really started to see this is a very realistic experience. As I did it myself, I even had to stop, process, think about what will I say next? Um, as I watched my learners, I really saw them come to life as practitioners in that environment. Virtual environment, as it may be, I could see them come to life. I could see how they might interact with children and other adults. Um, I could see the thinking happening as they sat there in that scenario, kind of processing what to say next. Um, 
what I really noticed is in the state of Illinois, we're lucky. A lot of our practitioners go right to children, right to families, right to best practices, right? They're really comfortable living in that IRE space, um, that FCR space. And I noticed that. I also noticed areas where, hey, this is where maybe my learners aren't as comfortable. So not only did it give me insight into where do they land as far as this prior learned assessment, what can I give them credit for within my program, but also what do I need to lean into more in my own program, um, understanding kind of what it shook out like when they got in um, to that classroom environment virtually. So I would just say that as I watched my learners, work through the process. They felt uncomfortable at first, right? It's a new environment. It feels it feels awkward. You're talking to an avatar, but as their assessment moves on, you really see them blossom. You really see those um, their knowledge of the credentials come out. The avatar does a great job kind of prompting them and 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 encouraging them to think towards towards that credential area, um, towards those competencies. And so I just want to say, if you are on the fence or you're not one, you know, you're kind of not sure, you're wondering about how, how does this fit into my system of prior learned credit? How do I make this work? I think it's worth exploring. I know at Western Illinois University, we're going to be looking at, you know, how do we think about maybe variable credit courses? Um, how do we look at this as part of what we take in for um, a course or an area within a course? and give people credit because we're really seeing that this brings a challenge to the table for them. It's not a walk in the park. It really does give us an authentic evaluation. Is there room for it to grow? For certain, right? We have, there's always room for it to grow. That's why there's a pilot. There's constant remediation being made. So anyway, um, I just hope that you'll give it a shot. Explore PLA as a process that you can use in your institution as a way to give credit for what people already know, but also as a temperature taker for your own program. It's really helpful. So I hope everybody has a great time at the forum. There's lots of information to learn. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Uh, as she just referenced, the Prior Learning Assessment Project has been challenging, innovative, and, and just more than exciting. Hey, Lindsay, uh, you're a very great center for those practices in early childhood education. Up oh, there we go. And we are really grateful for all the institutions that have partnered in this work. So moving on in this visual, what you're seeing here are the competencies that comprise the ECE level two credential. So we just talked about them in reference to PLA, but now this image now is highlighted in a way to show you how a CDA integrates into our credentialing structure. So an individual holding a preschool CDA meets the five competencies shown here in black type that are also specified on the state approved ECE credential framework. That does lead to some questions among institutions and a few of you uh, popped some of those in the chat box earlier today. So some of the questions were like, well, how am I gonna take apart my courses uh, so that a student learner only takes the segments of curriculum needed to gain the rest of the needed competencies? What do I do with a student who has a CDA? Um, and they've met some of these level two competencies as you can see here on screen, but not all of them. Uh, think about what Lindsay shared regarding PLA. What if the results of the assessment of prior learning show some level two competencies were met, but not all? Um, those competencies need to be gained in order for an individual to be able to attain their ECE level two. So modularization of courses may be one way to help meet both institutional and workforce needs. So here to share an exciting opportunity related to that is Dr. Jana Dara Ernst. Jana is the professor of early childhood education at Heartland Community College. Jana? And I think we're switching platforms again, folks. So I'm just going to tell you, we've got some different uh, clips that we're reading in here. So it takes us just a few seconds to move from one to the other. I can simply say I'm grateful Julie's the one who's doing that, because if it was me doing it, you'd be sitting here for a lot longer while I try to switch from one platform to another.
this is the pause that refreshes folks. What do you think, Julie? We have Jonna here with us. Jonna, could I be so bold as to ask you to kind of talk through this? Julie, what do you think? Should we move to that? Let's give Julie one more second and then she can let us know. And I'd be happy to if that's needed. I, Julie, I see you nodding your head. Okay, I will go ahead. I, I'll act like I'm video recording. So, um, <laughs> good idea. Yeah, thank you. And in fact, I'm just going to pull up if everybody can bear with me for one second. I'm going to um, pull up uh, the presentation just very quickly. So, we are going to have a series of five workshops and each of the workshops are gonna focus on specific steps in the modularization process. And they're going to include action items that are gonna support faculty in developing modularized syllabi over the course of the series. They'll include templates and examples to assist in the overall process. By the end of the series, faculty will have the tools and knowledge needed to modularize their courses to align with the gateways to opportunity credentials. One of the things that I just want to mention is that within each of the workshops, we'll be continuously referring to existing resources to support your work. So in this series of five workshops, the first one focuses on why modularize. Uh, the second one focuses on initial syllabi deconstruction. The third one focuses on constructing a modularized syllabi. So we're going to start with really kind of taking apart what you already have in place and then really thinking about how to put that back together in a meaningful way within the context of your unique program. In the fourth workshop, we're going to really look at what that program context means for you, like who key players are um, and throughout really who you need to be communicating with throughout each of the steps that you undertake. And in the fifth workshop, we're really going to look at program pathways and next steps. So there's going to be a huge focus on assessment and learning pathways. And at the end culmination of each workshop, we're going to spend some time on action steps that will take you through to the next workshop. It'll be very flexible. A lot of what we do will be based on the needs of each individual participant. So we're very hopeful that you will join us. And uh, if you are interested, please contact, I believe, Julie. So thank you so much. Donna, thank you. And thank you for your flexibility in going live here versus the uh, video presentation. So I think this is going to be a fascinating series of um, kind of discussions here and workshops. For those of you who are interested in participating, please use the email address you're seeing on screen to let us know your name, your institution, and the preferred way to contact you. Because we know some people like over summer months uh, want to use a personal email, say, versus a work email. So let us know the preferred way to contact you. Uh, we will be sending out a notice or an invitation to all uh, by email. So definitely more to come. I think this will answer um, many questions that, um, that faculty have. All right. Well, who knew that, uh, you know, playing with Legos could really be so much fun. So I, I just hope that you've enjoyed a little bit of this visual thinking about how credentials themselves can be seen as the Lego blocks, the way in which a specialization stacks onto a foundational credential or each competency can be seen as an individual um, building block. Uh, and what's exciting about that is I think this gives us a real opportunity here to think about uh, how we showcase this to the workforce, right? So that they can uh, be very transparent about uh, what credentials are needed for their pathway. So if we move on here and you think about um, competencies as, as kind of building blocks, work is underway right now to make the attainment of competencies very visible uh, to the workforce via a 
uh, via the Gateways Registry, it'll be a competency-based learner record. So we think that that will make it very easy for the field to understand visually which competencies they've achieved and where they have gaps, uh, and then how also to stack on specialization. So that is in development, more to come uh, as it continues to advance, but we're quite exciting that uh, we think that will be an excellent and much needed tool for our field. All right, um, I really wanna uh, thank you all of you to the faculty who showcased and shared uh, resources. We took the liberty of putting your name and contact information here on screen, uh, because I know sometimes a colleague wants to just reach out and talk with another colleague. So uh, these are the names and contact information. And once again, thanking uh, Nancy and Judd, Marcella, Jenna, Jana, and Lindsay for uh, sharing information with us today. We greatly appreciate your partnership. All right, we've got some breakout sessions coming up this afternoon, and Julie, I believe you are going to give us both some directions for those, and then maybe talk a little bit, give them a few our reminders about tomorrow. Is that correct? Great. Thank you. Um, so first off, um, for our afternoon interest sessions, um, we have What a Difference a Year Makes by our colleagues Marie Donovan and Ann Brennan. We have Breaking Down the Language Barrier, Creating the Spanish Language Associate's Degree for Early, early Educators. Um, and that is from our colleagues at College of Lake County. And finally, we have Innovative Competency-Based and Credit for Prior Learning Program Models at NL, NLU with our colleagues from National Lewis. So when I open up the breakout rooms, those are how you will pick which breakout you will go to. They are titled by that first part of their title of their presentation. And you are free to pick any of the um, interest sessions. So it's up to you to just click the little button on the um, left-hand side of the screen, and then you pick which breakout session you'd like to attend. Our breakout session will last an hour and we dismiss from uh, the breakout session. We do hope that you will be able to join us tomorrow morning. We'll start at 8.30 tomorrow morning. We have a wonderful presentation from Dr. Eric Lichtenberger and from Dr. Jennifer Kerms in regards to data. And then we have another set of interest sessions. Um, and then we will follow up and finalize the um, higher ed forum with uh, closing remarks from Dr. Stephanie Bernatite. So I will open up, the, I've got a few people coming into the, into the session. So I'm going to open up our breakout sessions and then you can begin uh, picking which one you'd like to attend. And as you can see, you should be able to pop that up and see which sessions are available and pick the one you'd like. <clears throat> 